Welcome to the virtual Cyber Diplomacy Masterclass. I am Ambassador at Large for Cyber Diplomacy at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor to introduce you to virtual Masterclass from Tallinn today. As a global community, we have found ways to stay connected with colleagues, friends and family through cyberspace during these recent months. This brings the issues of cybersecurity to the forefront of our attention. Today, we have planned several in-depth lectures on cyber issues in the context of international security, international law, and cyber capacity building. I believe these are key elements in strengthening cybersecurity globally. We will have with us We will have with us distinguished academic and other experts who will walk us through the key elements of international law applying in cyberspace, how the United Nations norms of responsible state behavior have been developed, and what are the main requirements for global cyber capacity building. We will be joined by Dr. James Lewis from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Dr. Catherine Lotrianti from the Institute for International Cyber Stability, Dr. Kubo Machak from International Committee of the Red Cross, Mr. Chris Painter from the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, Mr. Seem Aladalu from the EU Cybernet, and Mr. Tuno Tammer from the Estonian Information System Authority. Welcome to our five-hour virtual masterclass. In case you will have limited time to follow the full class today, you can also review the lectures later, as they will be available at the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. Let me begin. Let me begin by introducing the Cyber Diplomacy Agenda, which generally includes the following items. Norms, CBMs, international law in cyberspace, deterrence, and response to cyber operations in international security context. We also are discussing internet governance and internet freedom, foreign policy implications of new technologies, cyber capacity building and development assistance. Promoting cyber resilience and fight with cybercrime globally have become very important. The diplomats, of course, are also concentrating on relations with allies, partners and international organizations and we also engage with academia, civil society, and the private sector. Let me start by discussing the issues of international security. Major focus of cyber discussions within international security is related to the framework for cyber stability and responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Developed under the UN First Committee and reflected in the 2010, 2013 and 2015 consensus reports of the group of governmental experts. The framework includes states' commitment to adhere to existing international law, to follow non-binding peacetime norms of responsible state behaviour, to promote confidence-building measures and capacity-building efforts. Implementing this framework is a main goal for most of our countries on regional and global levels. International law plays a crucial role in maintaining stability and security in cyberspace. There is an agreement on UN General Assembly level that international law, particularly UN Nations Charter, applies in cyberspace as it applies in all other domains. This is the basis from which we must move forward. All states benefit from upholding a rules-based order in cyberspace. This means addressing the question, how does certain provisions of international law apply in cyberspace, as well as what are the legal consequences if those rules are violated and what are the remedies available to injured state? Thus far, these have been the main questions. We are now seeing increasing developments in addressing legal issues in several fora. We also see more and more countries presenting their own views on how international law applies. I very much welcome and encourage these statements. Existing international law has laid, has laid a solid normative framework for state actions, regardless of means 
or environment of these actions. New technologies will not change this fact and unique characteristics of cyberspace should not be seen as constraints to the application of international law. We must continue our collective efforts to understand legal issues when it comes to state conduct in cyberspace. Through global and regional capacity building initiatives, we can put forward our best efforts to understand the existing rules of the road. Secondly, we also are uh, implementing now confidence building measures and norms of responsible state behavior, which are equally important part of our global effort to ensure stability in cyberspace. The 2015 GG report has stipulated 11 norms that we should implement now. These discussions are currently ongoing in the UN First Committee. It is also important that the regional organizations will engage in cyber confidence building process. At the regional level, states should develop and implement confidence building and transparency measures that will enhance predictability of state behavior in cyberspace. The OSCE has developed two sets of cyber confidence building measures and work is ongoing on cyber CBMs in the ASEAN Regional Forum and in Organization of American States. The issues concerning international security in cyberspace will be covered today by lectures of Dr. James Lewis, Professor Katrin Lotrianti and Dr. Kubo Machak. Let me now turn to the next set of issues that cyber diplomats are addressing, which is related to internet freedom, internet governance and multi-stakeholder model of the internet. Internet governance refers to the development of norms, principles and standards in relation to how internet functions. In the heart of the internet governance ecosystem, there are several technical and norms creation organizations such as ICANN. And the multi-stakeholder model of internet governance by governments, the private sector and civil society has led us to the interoperable global internet that we all enjoy right now and have especially seen its importance during the uh, last months. Internet Governance Forum is a body that brings together different multi-stakeholder community actors to discuss internet relation uh, related issues. It is transparent and bottom-up forum. In addition, we also value the role of the private sector, academia and civil society very much in our multi-stakeholder community for internet governance and cybersecurity. We have to keep in mind that the private sector is the global infrastructure where cyberspace is developed, operated and maintained. The private firms are the ones who are providing us the cyberspace and therefore this sector is a critical actor in, in the realm of cyber security. We um, have seen very useful initiatives by the private sector to strengthen the current uh, cyberspace, such as uh, the Paris Call, Cybersecurity Tech Accord, and the others. Many private sector initiatives take the form of agreements among firms of security professionals related to behavior, including cooperation, information sharing, and respect for human rights. The first code of ethics can be seen as an example of this. Other initiatives by the private sector include more practical guidelines on the mitigation of various threats or on best practices of various technologies, such as the International Anti-Botnet Guideline. The private sector is also uniquely placed to develop and agree on various technical standards, codes of ethics and professional codes of conduct. Many of the private sector initiatives are driven by the understanding that most of the infrastructure that is targeted and abused in malicious ways is produced, managed and operated by the private sector. Unlike in traditional security threats, threats to digital security often occur for everyday citizens, computers and mobile devices. Also, the civil society plays a vital role in advocating for non-governmental and non-business organizations and movements in a larger ecosystem of uh, digital domain. Civil society protects and advances ordinary people and individual rights and stands for underrepresented or marginalized communities, voices and issues. Although many civil society initiatives and organizations operate on local levels uh, and smaller scales, 
many global initiatives have been created and are driven by actors in this sector. Academia, including think tanks, are important for disseminating and creation of knowledge on cyber diplomacy and cyber security. There are a plethora of research projects, academic programs, curricula, and other initiatives. However, today we are still talking about the cyber stability and cyber security as we um, understand these issues in the terms of state behavior. And I hope that in some of our lecture, next lecture series we can also talk about the broader multi-stakeholder environment and all these efforts in, in this broader setting. As a next very important item that the cyber diplomacy is concerned with is internet freedom. Freedom online and internet freedom includes freedom of expression, freedom of association, access to information, and freedom from online censorship. There is a landmark UN resolution from 2016 on internet freedom, which states that same rights that people have offline must be also protected online. Internet Freedom Coalition coordinates closely diplomatic efforts and engages with civil society and the private sector to advance internet freedom globally. It is a central foreign policy priority recently that the internet freedom will be followed. As a founding member of Freedom Online Coalition, Estonia is deeply committed to the human rights and freedoms proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We believe that the human rights that people have offline must be also protected online. We are committed to support internet freedom and protect human rights uh, online worldwide. Estonia shares concern, concerns about certain measures introduced in response to the COVID-19 crisis, including the use of certain surveillance practices, internet shutdowns and content moderation and censorship that may negatively impact the enjoyment of human rights. Such measures pose a risk of discrimination. State-sponsored obstruction of human rights is a direct challenge to the Freedom of Online Coalition goal to protect and promote and exercise human rights online and to maintain open, free, secure, reliable and interoperable internet. We are concerned by the measures taken by different malicious actors also to gain access to private information and spreading disinformation online. States should promote transparency and independent, effective domestic oversight related to electronic surveillance, use of contact takedown notices, limitations of restrictions on online content or user access and other similar measures, while committing ourselves to do the same. And finally, we have a second part of our lecture today dedicated to the issue of capacity building. Capacity building is an increasingly important topic on the agenda of cyber diplomacy because it is the capacity building that the majority of the countries globally are now concerned about. And in a larger UN setting, we have discussed the issues of capacity building, whether it will be the implementation of the norms of responsible state behavior, confidence building measures, or uh, international commitments, international law, capacity building underpins all these efforts. What we actually mean by capacity building is often less clear by several um, actors uh, also thinking different things when they are talking about capacity building. And let us maybe elaborate a bit in a, this introductory lecture, what are the different work streams within the broader capacity building agenda and how this lecture also could bring more um, information to the audience about capacity building. Digitalization is a supporting element and it is boosting growth and achieving the same goals as the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Digitalization today is also affecting all areas of human activity. The security of digital ecosystem is something that we are all concerned with. The cybersecurity is a distinctly separate area also in capacity building. And we should aim to integrate basic cybersecurity elements into all digitalization projects of development cooperation. The challenges people and countries face in cyberspace are common. 
increasing the capacities of all stakeholders and making them more resilient to interference and cyber attacks benefits everybody. Cyber capacity building encompasses both cybersecurity and combating cybercrime. And this continues to be the priorities of international cooperation for all our global cyber community. It is very important to raise awareness globally about cyber threats and cyber crime, and especially in the times of the global pandemic. There are already several very useful international instruments that could be taken as a blueprint for further efforts. For instance, the Budapest Convention remains the efficient international legal framework for combating cybercrime as it serves as a global instrument of reference for international cooperation. Estonia welcomes the possibility for the non-member states of the Council of Europe to accede to the Budapest Convention as this is the best model for countries seeking to develop their own national legislation and it provides all elements for developing the corresponding domestic legal frameworks. It is also critical for everyone globally to be acquainted with the basic principles of cybersecurity. In Estonia, we have put a lot of effort in ensuring that our education system not only provides our children with the basic digital skills but also make sure that they understand the basics of cyber security or cyber hygiene. Cyber hygiene courses are also included in what we are offering to uh, our partners because we think that um, end user awareness is very important in achieving cyber security. In, in addition, the conceptual and legislative and policy work in order to uh, increase cyber resilience remains very important. The cyber capacity building um, could be a very vast field with many components. And the key components, what we see here, would include advancing cyber incident response capacity on technical and organizational level, building computer emergency response teams, developing national cyber strategy, policy legislation, setting up public-private partnerships for cyber resilience of critical infrastructure, training, education and exercises, developing specialized cybersecurity courses at undergraduate and graduate level, and also creating basic cyber skills and cyber hygiene training for all end users. It all looks very domestic and uh, something that all the nations should do uh, themselves. But of course, uh, today you will also hear uh, more about the global efforts that have been taken in order to increase the capacity building options for the countries that might need some assistance in this um, respect. For instance, there is a global coordination effort underway, which is called Global Forum for Cyber Expertise. During the course today, you will hear from Mr. Chris Painter, what is the state of play with global cyber capacity building and how the coordination is organized. Also, uh, there is an upcoming cybersecurity multi tonal trust fund under the World Bank, which will start supporting cyber capacity building projects in medium and low income countries. And of course, in the UN First Committee, we are discussing the uh, awareness raising and capacity building is one of the problems that comes up quite often when we are discussing the cyber issues in the United Nations frameworks. Let me uh, stress the very efficient efforts that the European Union has been taken in terms of capacity building. The European Union has launched several systematic training programs since 2013 that is systematically linking cyber capacity building to development cooperation. There are multiple projects underway and those focuses of the projects are mostly cyber resilience or fighting with cybercrime. In 2013, uh, when the European Union started to focus on the cyber capacity building issues, the first item which was uh, uh, needing most of the attention was addressing cybercrime globally. There were several uh, projects, including CLASI and CLASI Plus, that have been set up together with the Council of Europe and that have helped to train a very large number of um, judicial and law enforcement personnel in all over the world, in Asia, in Latin America, in Africa. And, um, and this effort is still ongoing. 
Um, the training efforts by the Council of Europe uh, jointly with the European Union and um, other uh, partners from the world to address the cybercrime globally have been so far the largest capacity building projects that we have seen. And, and uh, uh, all of our European countries have been contributing to those projects. The second work stream for the European Union has been the um, increase of cyber resilience. There is a uh, uh, track record of a couple of projects which have taken place, like cyber for dev and some others, where focus is to build certs, to create national cyber security strategies and national cyber legislation. And um, there are some other um, quite useful efforts going on the way uh, in European eastern and southern neighborhood in terms of cyber capacity building. The European Union so far has been the largest donor uh, for cyber capacity building with uh, approximately cumulatively uh, 100 million euros spent on this area and this number is growing. Is growing. So um, uh, what we have seen now recently in the European Union is that there is an attempt to systematize all these efforts and also uh, to coordinate better and to create the possibilities and options to make sure that the delivery of the global capacity building efforts for your EU projects will be more streamlined. And for that, we have the EU CyberNet project created, which Estonia is leading, uh, or uh, Estonia is leading the consortium for the EU CyberNet, together with the Germany, Finland and Luxembourg. Today, you will hear more about this project by Mr. Seem Aladalu who is uh, going to introduce the basics for uh, how the uh, CyberNet coordination project will evolve and also it will have the possibilities to link up with uh, global partners. Cyber diplomacy only can be strong if we all are able to make sure that the national efforts of cybersecurity are provided and there is national cyber resilience. The critical infrastructure that we are actually protecting, whether we do it as a project for national cyber resilience or whether we want to implement the global norms of state behavior or confidence building measures, everything that we do in these terms also needs very clear national structures, uh, national responsibilities and national vision how we are going to do our cyberspace more uh, stable. You probably have heard this sentence that um, global cyberspace can be as strong as its weakest link. And maybe it is very often repeated sentence, but it is true. We cannot have a truly open, safe and secure cyberspace if we do not pay attention to national cyber resilience. There are many elements in building resilience, but let me finish today by explaining the Estonian model, how we are ensuring the protection of our networks and required national coordination. During my time as a cyber diplomat in the Estonian system, I find myself talking about the Estonian cyber model 50% of the time because the uh, number of the delegations that are coming to us and asking about these issues is still quite large. And I think it's also the very important mission for cyber diplomats to introduce the national models to other nations and make sure that there is uh, more resilience provided in these terms. In the end of 2018, Estonia has adopted a third gener generation cyber strategy and the previous ones date back to 2008 and 2013. In these consecutive strategies, we have laid out the main principles and goals for national cyber policy. First, we have understood that in order to have efficient national cyber um, resilience system, one has to have clear national strategic goals, governance and coordination mechanisms created or strengthened. The national strategic goals usually uh, are happening in, in, in the form of the national cyber strategy because uh, what you need to do is to bring together quite a large number of different stakeholders and ministries and agencies in your nation. The coordination on national level is something that is a must in the beginning. But of course, 
in addition to intergovernmental coordination, also each of our countries needs to establish and maintain partnership with the private sector, because the private sector owns and runs the critical infrastructure in most of our nations. The national public-private partnership for the cyber security is something which is uh, a unique for each nation, depending on its size and on its uh, resources, on its uh, institutional and historical traditions. We can observe different models of national cyber resilience throughout the European Union and possibly throughout the world. There are even more of those models. And um, each nation needs to find its own model, how they solve this question, how they build a public-private partnership on national level. What then needs to be done on national level is to make sure that there is an escalation mechanism of cyber crisis to the strategic decision-making level and to the national crisis management. The coordination and information exchange on national level with different agencies and ministries remains the key. Also, when we talk about escalation and uh, mainstreaming of cyber issues, it is vital that the top decision-making layer in both the public and private sector is involved in cyber decisions. In Estonia, we have created the National Cybersecurity Council uh, in 2008, and it is still a very relevant body. It is a very high-level uh, body, um, in including the permanent secretaries, uh, who are the highest-level civil servants in the Estonian system, uh, from different ministries, and um, they are doing the review of the national strategy implementation and also the decisions on, on resources and, and new um, strategic requirements for national cyber resilience. And last but not least, education exercises and training remains the key when we want to build secure cyberspace. Sometimes we are uh, comparing cyberspace with some other capabilities. And then we see that in cyberspace, we do not have very expensive equipment usually. We have the ICT technology. But actually what we need to value in cyberspace is our people. And to make sure that we have enough specialists and skilled cyber experts in our countries. Because only the cyber experts in our countries are the ones that are able to build cyber resilient systems, and also in times when we are either attacked or have crisis, it's our local experts that we are relying on. We cannot fly in massive number of foreign experts when we are under attack, so it only can happen when you have your own experts present in your own country. So the national cybersecurity culture and public awareness, as well as different uh, education exercise and training programs and special education for cyber experts, is something that uh, we all need to have. In Estonia, we started to mainstream cyber issues to all IT um, modules, and uh, also we have created specialized master and PhD programs for, for cyber uh, security experts only. Sometimes technical, but also organizational, because cybersecurity is not only a technical issue. It is largely procedures, processes, people, and technology. So technology is one-fourth in this bigger picture. Um, we are, of course, the country that has raised lots of um, questions, and we are very glad to um, also um, export our knowledge uh, on national cyber resilience. And um, I think uh, today we have Mr. Tsunu Tammer from the Estonian CERT Computer Emergency Response Team as a last speaker who will explain how to address the threats in cyberspace, how to prevent, manage and recover from those threats and, and how cyberspace could be protected on a national level because it's only if our cyber um, systems on national level are strong enough that we can also um, secure the global cyber stability. Thank you. And now we are starting our um, masterclass with the lecture by Dr. James Lewis. 
James Lewis is a senior vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Before joining CSIS, he worked at the Department of State and Commerce as a diplomat and as a member of the Senior Executive Service. His experience includes a broad range of diplomatic and political military assignments. Dr. Lewis helped develop policies of encryption and the Internet. He led the US delegation to the Wassenaar Arrangement Experts Group on advanced civil and military technologies and was a rapporteur for the UN Group of Governmental Experts on Information Security for 2010, 2013 and 2015 sessions. He led a running track of 2.5 discussions on cybersecurity with the um, Chinese Institute of Contemporary International Relations. Dr. Lewis has authored numerous publications since coming to CSIS on cybersecurity. He is frequently quoted in the media and has testified numerous times before Congress. Lewis's current research examines how the Internet has changed politics and how digital technology will reshape society and international relations. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago. The floor is yours, James. Thank you, Heli, and good morning to everyone. Uh, my appreciation to Estonia for undertaking this uh, very important effort. Um, I'm going to give you some background on the negotiations in the first committee and put that in the context of building a framework for responsible state security. Cyber operations, cyber techniques are another tool for coercion and attack. And the principal sort of source of risk is states. Um, that means building an agreement framework on responsible state behavior is crucial for stability. This began in 1998 when the Russian Federation proposed a treaty. A uh, treaty may not be a bad idea sometime in the future, but at the moment it's premature. Um, a treaty faces serious problems in terms of there's no agreed definition on what is a weapon, what is an attack, how you would verify it. So while the issue of why don't we have a binding agreement continues to come up, it's the difficulties of defining this binding agreement that make it important not to, uh, not to rush into it. Um, the UN First Committee, however, uh, began a series of negotiations the first of these was, of course, the group of government experts, the GGE, uh, now in its sixth round with 25 experts. Uh, in 2019, the first committee also added the open-ended working group, in part as a way to address some of the criticisms of the GGE, that it was closed, it was secretive, there wasn't a chance for other countries to participate. And one of the things we've seen in the OEWG sessions is broad global interest. Uh, I think at the first session, 140 countries showed up, about 90 of them spoke. Uh, deep uh, knowledge and concern in many nations. So the OEWG and the GGE worked together to create and reinforce this framework. Um, these negotiations are, as are all UN negotiations, uh, a consensus process. Everyone must agree. And this, of course, puts a uh, ceiling on what can be done. Uh, sometimes you hear complaints that the agreements, the agreed texts aren't ambitious enough. Um, that's because of the need for consensus. There's also, and those of you who have negotiated know this, there's a value to ambiguity. Uh, ambiguity helps in reaching agreement. Uh, the agreements that we have, and in particular the 2015 a GGE report whose conclusions were endorsed by the General Assembly um, follows a negotiating logic, not the logic of lawyers or, or academics. Um, and it's worth noting that as you do preparatory work on this, that sometimes media coverage and academic analysis can be confused. In 2017, for example, uh, many people announced that the UN negotiations were over, that they were dead. Uh, that turned out to be wrong. Let's quickly walk through the, the history of the three agreed texts. In 2008, 
uh, a number of academics, including myself, proposed that we think of an alternative to a binding agreement that would involve norms and confidence building measures as the basis to build trust that could eventually lead to some stronger agreement. And the models we used were the missile technology control regime, the Treaty on uh, Conventional Forces in Europe, the Helsinki Agreement, very much an arms control approach at the start of this process. Um, in 2010, there was agreement for the first time in the GGE. It's worth noting that this agreement was only 94 words, but it set the agenda that we have followed ever since. Uh, norms, CBMs, and capacity building. On capacity building, it's worth noting that this was not part of the original uh, text and the South African expert said that speaking as a representative of the developing world, he would block consensus unless we added capacity building. So from those very few words in 2010, we've seen a whole growth of efforts on capacity building, on creating norms, and on uh, developing confidence building measures. Um, norms, of course, are what states should do, what they should not do, and how they interact with others. Norms are not binding in the context of the GGE reports. That's not necessarily bad, and we can talk about that later. Um, there's some issues that are off the table in the group of government experts, and part of that reflects its first committee mandate. The first committee, as you know, focuses on disarmament and international security. So topics of espionage, crime, internet governance, are not part of the discussion in either the GGE or the OEWG. They're recognized, of course, as uh, factors that could diminish stability in cyberspace, factors that could affect international security. But they're largely handled in other groups, uh, the UNODC, um, the IGF, or IGF Plus now. Uh, these are the groups under the second committee and other UN bodies that tackle these issues. It's not a dilemma because there's plenty of work when it just comes to international security, right? 2013 and the GGE report of 2013 were in some ways the breakthrough. Um, I should note that one thing that has been consistently true is the GGEs have all had very strong chairs. Uh, and the strong chairs are Russian and Australian, a Brazilian, and now another Brazilian have been instrumental in their success. The chairs are the ones who at the end of the day have to pull the agreement together. 2013 put cybersecurity in the existing structure of international relations. This immediately makes it a much easier problem for people to understand, for people to deal with. Um, it emphasized the centrality of the UN Charter, the concepts of state sovereignty, um, international law, and of course the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So 2013 saw agreement to embed cybersecurity in the existing structure of international relations. Um, I should note that in these discussions, the required expertise is not technical, right? Sometimes you'll hear a complaint, well, there should be more technical experts in these discussions. Um, at the beginning, when I first participated, we had technical experts in the room and they were um, helpless. These are negotiations on international security and the expertise you need is political, it's in non-proliferation, it's in security in general. And now of course we have this new set of expertise, expertise in cyber issues. So not technical, definitely not lawyers, um, but political and security focus. So 2013 in some ways broke the barriers for uh, what um, we thought we would be able to do. 2015, of course, is the uh, crucial agreement. It built on the agreement of 2013. Um, it's crucial because it was endorsed by all member nations unanimously in the 2015 UN General Assembly. The 2015 agreement, as you heard, laid out um, 11 agreed norms. It identified a range of confidence building measures, and it again discussed the need for capacity building. 
this is a package that fits together when we think about the framework for responsible state behavior. Um, norms tell states how they should act in cyberspace. Confidence building measures build the trust that other states are also following those norms. And capacity building gives states the capability to both observe norms and participate in confidence building exercises. So these three elements fit together into a package that allows states to interact and to build security and stability in cyberspace. Um, the 2015 agreement identified CBMs to expand transparency and to improve cooperation. Uh, it defined state responsibilities under in existing international practice and commitments. And this is worth noting because sometimes people feel like, how can I understand cybersecurity? How can I participate in these, these negotiations or discussions? And the answer is it's not technical expertise. Be helpful to have, of course, but it's not important. What's necessary is an understanding of your national interests in cyberspace, the existing agreements you already have under international law, under the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, these are the things that shape our discussion. Uh, and so 2015 uh, saw the creation of a framework for responsible state behavior that was agreed to by all UN member states. Um, we now have uh, two sets of processes going on. Um, it's worth noting that there was another GGE in 2017 that uh, did not reach consensus. And the reason it didn't reach consensus is largely because there was an effort to define uh, how international law applied. Um, what we've seen is all nations agree that international law applies, right? Um, but they do not want to become more specific in how that applies in cyberspace. Um, they want to leave that to national discretion. And there's some key issues here. What is the use of force in cyberspace? Uh, the use of force is, of course, the term in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter that talks about the limitations on states and their military activities. Um, but there is no agreement on how to define use of force. Um, we tried in the past, particularly in uh, 2013, to develop a definition of use of force, but those were politically unacceptable. Um, you can have groups of lawyers or you can have groups of academics write definitions that are uh, brilliant. Um, I felt my own definition was brilliant, but it was rejected in about two minutes in the negotiation. And afterwards, I asked one of the leading Western negotiators, why did, why did you object to this? And what she said was, it wasn't Helly, it was the British expert. What she said is, my prime minister wants to reserve the right to decide when something is an armed attack or use of force. Armed attack isn't defined. It's worth noting that these things are also not defined in the UN Charter. And going back to the point on ambiguity, it's an agreement if you have a concept use of force, but you leave it to nations to decide how they will apply that. It's easier to decide um, how you would perceive an armed attack. And this is where national discretion comes in. There's an informal understanding that attacks that cause uh, death, casualties, destruction, um, probably qualify as an armed attack, right? There's something that needs still to be worked out in international discussion. Um, one of the areas of ambiguity in this is uh, physical destruction, we all understand. When you see a building, you know, damaged or destroyed, we all understand that was an attack. What if the target is data? What if the damage is logical? What if it's erasing databases or frying servers? Um, does that qualify? The answer is probably yes, but there is no agreement on that. So one of the tasks for the next few years is to come to a better understanding internationally on what qualifies as an armed attack. But right now, it's very much left to national discretion. And many states prefer it that way. Um, this is one of the obstacles to a treaty, is that we will need to come up with these better definitions of what qualifies as an armed attack. 
Of course, there's been discussion in regional groups on these. NATO took many years, beginning in uh, 2007 with the uh, interference with the Estonian government's uh, internet connections. Did that qualify as an attack? Did that trigger Article 5 of the NATO agreement? And it took many years for NATO to work through that. It will take even more years to develop an international consensus, but that's the path we are on. Um, UN member states agreed at the General Assembly to observe the 2015 recommendations, and it's worth looking at those 11 norms. They are exceptionally valuable. They provide us with uh, a good framework to define how states should behave. Um, there's some important parts in there. There's an agreement uh, not to attack critical infrastructure contrary to your obligations under international law. Now, this was a, a point of some dissent, and it remains so, um, because the initial language wanted to say no attack on critical infrastructure in peacetime. Uh, several states objected to that. Um, the second uh, iteration was uh, no attacks on critical infrastructure contrary to your commitments under the Geneva and Hague treaties. Uh, and there was uh, objection to that as well. The formulation that ultimately worked was no attacks on critical infrastructure contrary to your commitments under international law. And those commitments are described uh, a few paragraphs later. It's the commitments to observe proportion, proportionality, distinction, discrimination, um, the principles of the laws of armed conflict in international humanitarian law. We'll hear more about that later today, uh, but people were unwilling to say the names of the conventions, the actual references to LOAC, still an issue, uh, laws of armed conflict, um, but they were willing to acknowledge that these principles applied. So there is in the 2015 agreement a single paragraph on how international law applies. Um, it's worth noting that in discussions with experts in the current round of talks, both in the GGE and in the open-ended working group, um, some major countries have said, while they can live with the language that's in the 2015 agreement that says that international law applies to cyberspace and to state behavior, uh, they cannot go much further than that. In fact, they can't go any further than that, or they will withdraw consent. So we have a, a ceiling on international law, and in some ways that makes this easier, right? Because we have a, uh, an ability and a flexibility to come to agreements uh, in this area, right? What's the value of non-binding norms? And you hear this very often, well, it's not binding, so therefore it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't account. First of all, you have the agreement uh, by all member states to observe the 2015 norms right and to be guided in their behavior by these norms that's a crucial fact we have a global agreement on how states should behave in cyberspace um norms provide guidelines for state behaviors they give states an idea of what is expected of them right and equally important they provide uh a justification for potential responses to a state who fails to observe its obligations under these agreed norms, right? And this has become one of the central issues for our discussion is uh, how do you respond when states do not observe norms? Now, this is not a new problem. You see this in other arms control areas. You see this in in human rights and in states' behavior. I mean, one of the models for thinking about cybersecurity is responsibility to protect, also not binding. There are many precedents in the UN for um, thinking about how to take action against a state that fails to observe its international obligations. And this is where the 2015 norms in particular are important. You sometimes hear that we need to work with countries to help them implement the norms. You don't implement norms. It's not like a cookbook. Uh, you observe norms, right? And so how do we get 
countries to observe and conform their behavior to the agreed norms. And this leads us into a difficult issue of countermeasures and retortion, uh, things that are allowed to states to take action in response to someone who violates the 2015 norms. A difficult area, another one where we were unable to get agreement uh, in the context of the UN. But again, if you have an understanding that the UN Charter applies, your behavior is defined by these norms. If you do not observe the norms, it allows other states the potential to find punitive responses. Uh, and this has become a crucial, crucial element. So where are we now? Uh, as I said, we have two negotiating processes, uh, the group of government experts, GGE, and the open-ended working group, uh, the OEWG. They're different in that the OEWG involves all member states. It allows for particip participation by non-governmental actors. There's been some dispute over this. A couple countries have said we do not want uh, the private sector, we do not want non-governmental actors participating in the OEWG. Um, that's created some limitations, but there are groups that have been approved by the UN in other contexts that have been allowed to speak. Um, the OEWG is open. You can watch its deliberations online. So it's a great process for developing a deeper understanding, a broader uh, broader participation in the discussion of international cybersecurity. It's worth noting, and sometimes people say, well, how, if you have two groups that have almost exactly the same mandate, how do you avoid them from coming into conflict? How do you avoid them from, uh, you know, turning into rival camps? And part of the answer is very strong chairs in both groups. Uh, I've mentioned earlier the importance of strong chairs. The chairs coordinate closely, and so I'm very optimistic that, in fact, the OEWG and the GGE will come up with complementary actions. Um, in fact, uh, the advantage of the GGE is it turns out it's easier to have deep interactive discussions uh, among a smaller group of experts. When you have 140 countries in the room, if one says something, and when you go through the list of speakers, it might be a half hour before anyone can respond, right? Um, in the GGE, it's interactive people sit across each other from a small table and they can talk. Um, we, uh, there's broad interest in these discussions. Uh, at the request of the Department of State, uh, we prepared a, a backgrounder on the negotiations. It's, it's a guide to what's going on in these things. Uh, I think it's on our website. Um, what are we facing, though? We're facing uh, significant differences in national views over a rules-based approach and over universal values. I sometimes worry that if we were to negotiate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights again, um, we would not have consensus on it. Uh, but we do have it now. Uh, there's, again, dispute over how these values apply. Uh, some people say we need new norms. There are a couple that are out there, one on the core of the internet, one on election interference, that might be useful. But in point of fact, most activities are already covered by the 2015 norms. And the goal, of course, is how do we increase state observation of these norms? How do we ensure that states' behavior is in accordance with this framework for resp responsible state behavior? The issue on CBMs has changed. Uh, there's been remarkably successful work in regional groups on implementing the confidence building measures agreed to in 2015. And in particular, I would point to the uh, Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, uh, the Organization of American States, uh, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and uh, now the African Union. These regional organizations are the center of activity on confidence building measures. And they've done um, remarkable work uh, in reaching agreement among their members. Um, but 
In the future, we may very well have to think about non-cooperative CBMs among states who are essentially hostile to each other. This was not the case in 2015. We assumed that everyone was more or less in agreement politically. Um, whether that was true or not, then it's certainly much less true now. And over the course of the negotiations, I've been involved in four, uh, we've seen this area of agreement shrink. And that, of course, creates a more difficult environment. And so we do need to think when states are unfriendly, how do we build confidence? What do those measures look like? How do we do that in a way that reinforces the observation of the agreed 2015 norms? Okay. Um, a difficult issue, and we opened by talking about the Russian proposal to uh, have a binding treaty. Um, I actually agree with some of the Russian points. Um, we probably do need to uh, ultimately have a binding treaty. That's years off, right? We probably do need to have better understandings of some of the definitions. The nature of warfare has changed. Um, the 2016 election interference was a new kind of warfare, not necessarily covered, uh, at least in detail, in the UN Charter or in the existing agreements. So we do have a lot of work before us, but um, the starting point for that must be the framework for responsible state behavior agreed in 2015. States' observation of that framework, and if it's not observed, the potential for uh, response or retaliatory action against those who've transgressed. Cyber is a difficult field because it does not pose an existential threat. When you think of the whole series of arms control and non-proliferation agreements that were developed in the 20th century, um, their starting point was the Cuban Missile Crisis where the world came very close to nuclear war that frightened many countries, including the two leading nuclear powers, and they began a process of agreement. We don't have that existential threat yet driving us in cyberspace. Um, this reduces the incentives for agreement. There's still room. I think we will see agreement out of both of the groups now, but the process will be longer. Reinforced and accelerated, of course, as we become more dependent on the internet. So. Whereas cyber was not an existential threat in 1998 or in 2010, it may very well be an existential threat by 2030. And that will help us as negotiators. Um, cyber will be part of the international agenda moving forward, part of the international security agenda moving forward. It's an area where all nations must develop expertise. And one of the lessons we've learned, I'm sure you'll hear about it later on, is Capacity building must include capacity in policy making for cybersecurity issues. Um, this is a long process. We are in some ways only five years into it, but there's been remarkable success that I expect will be duplicated in the current round of negotiations. Delayed, of course, by the COVID virus, but um, something that in 2021 we can expect to see uh, a new set of agreements among all UN members. And so on that optimistic note, I'll stop and leave the floor open for questions. Luis, for your very, um, thank you for your really good uh, explanation of all these uh, questions. Uh, we have received a couple of uh, uh, questions from the audience and uh, and if I may, um, to read some of them. First question, how the non-binding norms will contribute to cyber stability? What is the role of norms? And how do you see nation states will recognize and respect the norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace? Because as we know, there are uh, norms are non-binding uh, in the 2015 GT report. So. That's a great question and it's central to our discussion. Um, I think what we need to think about though is that um, the application of these norms, the development of these norms creates guidelines for state behavior. 
we now can say, what does responsible state behavior in cyberspace look like? So the fact that they're non-binding isn't that important, frankly, for me, because states have agreed, I will follow these. If you think about many agreements, the missile technology control regime, for example, very important, not binding. Um, binding, not binding, not a crucial point. What's crucial, and this is true for many international security issues, is that there's a common understanding. We have that thanks to 2015. And now some mechanism, some activity to encourage observation of those norms. And I think that's the space we're moving into. It's not so much that we need new norms, it's that we need actions to ensure that states observe them. I think that will define much of the activity for the next few years. So the fact that they're non-binding does not mean they do not have force. The norms do have force, and it's up to states to make sure that they're observed. So, thank you. Uh, then we have um, heard from you about the question of international law and how this has been central in the GG um, discussion so far. Um, as all of us sitting in the uh, UN First Committee uh, debates, we know that there is also some politics involved with international law. And uh, sometimes those discussions have less of the legal nature or, than political. So how you maybe can comment uh, on this aspect of um, international law application. And, and uh, we, of course, are encouraging to, uh, the fact that the existing international law should be applied uh, because we think that this is key for us and, and to make sure that there is cyber stability ensured. You know, that's a, that one of the worst mistakes I made, I think it was in 2013, was uh, I proposed to the chair that we take all the lawyers in the room, because many countries bring lawyers in their delegations, that we take all the lawyers and send them out of the room uh, and have them have a working group to discuss legal issues. And this was very helpful because it allowed us to make uh, progress on the text uh, that was finally agreed in 2013. The dilemma was that when the lawyers came back, they thought we were actually going to pay attention to what they had said. And that sounds a bit uh, awkward because there are strong political disagreements uh, between major powers on how international law applies. Um, all countries agreed that it applies, but they did not agree how it applies. And that reflects differences in a couple areas. One, and I hope we'll hear from this from some of our other on this from our some of our other colleagues is, if we endorse international law as applying to cyberspace, if we talk about how it applies, um, if we define use of force or armed attack, which are the terms used in the UN Charter, this will legitimize uh, warfare in cyberspace. And a few nations say. The internet should be a zone of peace. Uh, the ones who say that are ones who we know have very strong military capabilities. Uh, well, that's negotiations for you. Um, so many other countries say, oh, let's be serious. Dozens of countries are developing military cyber capabilities. Let's make sure that they're embedded in the existing understandings and commitments uh, on the use of force, on the use of uh, military operations. Um, this is a profound area for dispute. Um, some countries would prefer to see um, the rule-based order uh, eroded, uh, eroded so that they can change it in ways that re-emphasize the importance of national sovereignty. Um, to give a quick potted history, in 1945, at the end of a fabulously destructive war, uh, all nations agreed, we can't have this happen again. And so they developed the UN Charter, they developed the UN Declaration of Human Rights. States essentially gave up an element, a portion of their sovereign control. They said, sovereignty is diminished, universal values take precedence. And now there's a number of states that would like to reconsider that bargain. They would like to see sovereignty um, increase its influence. Uh, and you hear this sometimes in the discussion, well, 
these universal values, when you say I'm not observing them, you're interfering in my internal affairs, right? Uh, that's the debate, is that you agreed to give up some of your sovereignty in human rights and in the use of force, and now people want to reconsider that, uh, that agreement. And some of it just reflects the high level of distrust. Uh, the level of distrust, which was high in 20 has only increased. So one of the tasks for the negotiating groups now is to th think about what are the mechanisms we can develop in the UN context? And everyone agrees on the centrality of the UN. The UN is the place where these discussions must happen. That gives states a leading role. But in that UN context, what are the mechanisms we might want to develop to um, increase trust uh, so that countries are more willing to make progress on some of these difficult issues uh, like uh, the application of international law. At times it can be um, humorous from an external point of view. Uh, in uh, 2013 and 2015, the last two agreements, um, a few states objected to uh, references to Article 51, the inherent right of self-defense. Um, now, the objections are feckless. They do not have effect. Everyone has agreed under the UN Charter that Article 51, the right to use force uh, in response to an armed attack without going to the Security Council, everyone has agreed to that. So why not put it in the cyber agreements? And people were afraid that if we did that, it would, it would justify um, uh, re retaliation, it would justify offensive operations, so you had this unusual situation of people objecting to references to Article 51. Um, by It's implicitly agreed to by the commitment repeated multiple times that the UN Charter applies to international lies, but there was no agreement to name that specifically. And I think that's where, between the discomfort, between the lack of familiarity with this new kind of warfare and these new technologies, um, people will need to think through um, how international law applies. Uh, we don't want to rush to any conclusions uh, if we want to win agreement. Um, but let me co pause on one note, uh, if you don't mind. Um, the issue is not whether or not international law applies. Everyone agrees to that. Um, they won't describe how it applies, and that means it's up to states, like-minded states, to develop and implement those understandings. They have to be credible, but that might be the basis for reaching agreement in the UN, is that the task now falls to the states that believe in international law to begin to talk how it's talk about how it's implemented, to begin to put that forward. forward. We won't get agreement on that this year, but if we start to define it, um, it will move us in the right direction. This, this certainly is uh, true that uh, states have to also uh, show the way and uh, um, come up with uh, the um, international law uh, uh, implementation and, and, and how they see international law applying. Um, uh, and it, it follows kind of naturally that um, we are still battling with the accountability when it comes to the state conduct in cyberspace. And, um, and uh, may I also ask you, uh, how do you see attribution and um, increased accountability could help to implement the cyber stability framework? It's good that we have an agreed framework. And so I think that uh, Sometimes I've asked some of the the people who have been the most uh, the negotiators who've raised the most opposition. You know, why did you agree to this in 2015? Um, well, for whatever reason, they did agree to it, and we now have this framework. Um, as with any international activity, uh, a framework by itself is meaningless. You need to have accountability, and accountability means that states need to take action when the framework is not being observed. That's the only way you're going to get 
uh, accountability. Only if states um, take action when the framework is not being observed. Uh, I'm a little harder on this than some people, but you know, I'll quote a, a famous European statement who, when told that the uh, the uh, the the Pope objected to some of his, and, and I'm a Catholic, so I can say this. The Pope objected to some of his activities. He said, how many divisions had the Pope? Now, of course, over the long term, the influence, the soft power of these organizations is, is important. But in the, in, the, in the first instance, it is states and their ability to impose penalties or to be coercive in response to a failure to observe the norms that creates accountability. Only state action will create accountability. Um, it can be reinforced by the private sector, and that's been very helpful when you think of the actions that have been taken in the past few years. They reinforce this framework. It's important to have the private sector, to have civil society involved in this and participating and lending their voice and their strength. But we need to think about what is the role of states in developing accountability. And part of this involves attribution. Sometimes you hear, and I hope the people who are attending this very valuable set of lectures leave with the understanding that attribution was indeed a major problem 10 years ago. It's decreasingly important as a problem. Um, several major cyber powers, and not all cyber powers are large states, but I would say there's probably half a dozen countries in the world that now can um, attribute the source of a, an attack in the majority of cases. Uh, not all, but in the majority of cases. And of course, over time, and uh, if the actions are repeated, attribution is less and less of a problem. And it wouldn't be a surprise if five years from now, um, attribution was not a problem at all. So sometimes you hear people say, we don't know where the attack came from. Nonsense. We know where the attack came from. The question is, what do we do about it? Uh, because attribution in itself is not that useful unless it's accompanied by action. Uh, sometimes you hear the phrase name and shame. Well, no big power on any side of this dispute. No big power is going to be shamed. They just aren't going to be embarrassed. Of course, we know what they'll do. The first thing they'll say is, oh, it wasn't us. How could you even think that? You know, we see this not only in cyber, but in many, many areas of coercion and the use of force or the threat to use force. So it's not so much the ability to determine who is the attacker. Uh, there, it's the ability to take action on, as a result of that determination. There, there is a dilemma here for cooperation among like-minded states, which is very often the ability to attribute is based on very sensitive intelligence activities. And you'll have, I've had this discussion with a, a European country. They said, look, you, you, the United States, say that you won't know who the source of the attack was, and it's based on intelligence methods, but you won't tell us what they were, right? And so we have to go to our parliament and get approval uh, for, um, joining you in some response action to do that we can't just go in and say the americans told us and we believe them we need something else this is a dilemma for attribution not that attribution is hard but that, that we can't always share uh what's been done in that regard this is again the, where the framework for norms is helpful if we can make the attribution if everyone agrees on the attribution uh, we can then use that as the basis for action against uh, against the state that violated the agreed norms or that failed to observe the agreed norms. So an increasingly important problem, uh, but it falls into this category of what are the actions we as an international community will take uh, to enforce, to require observation of norms. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, James. And uh, I, I hope that we can really work on, on all these avenues. And, and we really um, are very thankful for you to join us today and uh, discuss and explain all these difficult concepts for all our viewers. As I understand, we have uh, viewers from all over the world.
from Africa, India, uh, Latin America. And, um, and so questions for you were most numerous, I must say. So thank you for answering. And uh, um, thank you also for um, uh, being the uh, first lecturer at our virtual masterclass. Thank you. Uh Our next speaker will be Dr. Catherine Lotrionti, who is a senior associate in the technology policy program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and previously was a Prince Gowcroft Scholar at the Atlantic Council. She is also the founder and former director of the cyber project at Georgetown University, where she has taught and has written on international and national security law, international affairs and technology. Catherine was kicking um, uh, uh, off the annual international conference on cyber engagement several years ago, which draws on the experience of government practitioners, industry representatives and academic scholars, uh, also multidisciplinary and global approach to the challenges in cyberspace. Dr. Lotrianci previously served as counsel to the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board at the White House, uh, also on the Joint Inquiry Committee of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and as an Assistant General Counsel at the Central Intelligence Agency and in the U.S. Department of Justice. She's an, in, an internationally recognized expert on international law and cyber conflict and has testified before Congress um, and NATO on cyber issues. She has authored numerous publications on a broad array of topics, including espionage, information technology, international law, and deterrence, and is a frequent speaker at cyber conferences across the global world. Dr. Lotrionce holds an MA and PhD from Georgetown University and from New York University, and she's a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Katrin, so much uh, thanks for joining us today here, and I think where James left it off with attribution, accountability, and all these difficult questions. So uh, your lecture on international law applying on peacetime cyber operations very logically follows from this. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Heli. Um, and thank you, everybody, uh, for inviting me to join you in this class. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about things that I uh, love speaking about, and that is international law and love teaching um, the subject. So I'll start with my slides. Now we're gonna cover in the first session what I'd refer to as a use ad bellum in international law. These are the laws that are apply during peacetime. So when states are not in a state of armed conflict, um, that um, part of international law will be covered in our next le lecture. Uh, but this will cover those laws that are applicable uh, when we're not in a state of armed conflict. Um, it's pretty lengthy and detailed, my slides. Hopefully um, you'll have an opportunity to look back at them when you um, would like to have more time. I went back and actually created a table of contents because it got um, quite detailed so we could hopefully um, follow along. Um, I'll first cover um, briefly sources of international law. In my discussion, um, this area of the law deals uh, both with treaty law mainly the UN Charter, which you'll see uh, citations to in the slides, but also quite a bit of customary international law. So I'll first um, begin by defining those terms. And then I'll um, go quickly into the a number of the key legal principles, most of which um, in this area will come from customary law, but some like the use of force will also be based um, not only in custom, but treaty, the UN Charter. But I'll start with sovereignty, I'll move on to the um, derivative principles of sovereignty, which are very important. And then last but not least for sure, on general principles of state responsibility, it will be um, key to a number of points that we wanna discuss both attribution um, for uh, wrongful international acts, but also in the circumstances precluding uh, wrongfulness, we'll talk about a number of principles that have developed, which allow states to take action that they otherwise wouldn't be allowed to do under international law, but in response to a state's breach of an international obligation. So that is what um, uh, Dr. Lewis uh, was talking about in terms of holding other states accountable and consequences. 
So first, though, uh, for some basic propositions about international law, especially since there's been some discussion um, that maybe no law applies in cyberspace because we don't have a treaty. I wanted to put forth some of these basic propositions. First, that there are principles of international law that apply in all human activities. These principles apply in any domain, law, a land, air, sea, outer space, and cyberspace. And these principles that exist, they may come from customary international law. We may not have a treaty specifically dealing with cyber specific aspects, um, but they are covered under international principles. Um, these principles can be changed and modified and clarified by states, of course. Now, as an opening um, throughout the slides in our discussion, I will refer back to states, um, a number of states claims about international law with respect to um, cyber operations and activities. Um, I will refer mostly to the UNGG report from 2012 and 2015 um, that Dr. Lewis talked about. And I also will refer to, it is a pre-draft um, report it's on the UN uh, website, but this is the most recent statement from the open-ended working group um, of representing all members of the General Assembly. And in a general statement the, uh, that came out in May of uh, 2020 in the second um, version of this report, draft report, the, the country said in the, their discussions at the open-ended working group, states reaffirmed that international law and in particular, the Charter of the United Nations is applicable and essential to maintaining peace and stability and promoting an open, secure, stable, accessible, and peaceful ICT environment. They also went on to say it was suggested that while existing bodies of international law do not include specific reference to the use of ICTs in the context of international security, international security can develop progressively, including through its practical application. And this will be, um, much of the development of international law and what we will talk about today is how that law can develop, what we know about the law uh, and the principles at issue that may be the core of the development of future agreement, um, legally based obligations when it comes to cyber activities. Now, I did want to say up front what area of international law that would be relevant during peacetime but I did not have, and also applicable uh, potentially to cyber activities that I did not have time and will not have time to cover in this lecture. And this is um, here listed on the fifth slide. For instance, I do not um, cover human rights law, environmental law, law of the sea, criminal law, jurisdiction, state immunity, injury to aliens. My focus also for this talk is on, as relevant, I may mention non-state actors, but the focus is on the activities and behavior of state actors. So first, to just um, briefly go over the sources of international law. Um, from the statute of the International Court of Justice, Article 38 in the UN Charter, when that court was established in 1945 as part of the UN Charter, there were a list of sources of international law um, at different, forms of international law that the court would use in rendering its decisions. The two principal sources are treaties and custom. Our talk today and what I'll identify will cover both treaties and custom. So I want to take um, a minute just to lay these out. Um, according um, to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the definition of treaties is an international agreement conducted between states in written form and governed by international law. We'll talk about the UN Charter as a treaty and mainly in this talk. Um, custom also is a principle and equally um, legally binding uh, source of law. Uh, the definition from the ICJ statute is that custom is a general practice accepted as law. An example of that is in um, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations was eventually signed in 19 and went into force in 1961. But prior to that treaty being in force, there was a long standing customary law dealing with the uh, immunity of diplomats and basically the entire development of diplomatic immunity um, stemmed from customary law prior to the treaty actually being um, negotiated and entered into force. 
Um, I will briefly touch upon now just two of the subsidiary means for determining rules of law under international law. These also are cited to in the ICJ statute, but there's a note of caution here. They're called subsidiary means because they are not in and of themselves law. The role of both the judicial decisions, typically international courts like the ICJ, the ICTY and other tribunals, as well as the teachings and writings of the highly qualified publicists, they are um, used as subsidiary sources to help identify what the law is and tell us what the law is. So it is a, a note of caution that they're not actually law in and of themselves, um, but um, they have had an impact in terms of particularly the development of customary international law. And we will reference uh, in my talk, I will reference quite a few of the ICJ decisions that are relevant to the principles that we're going to be um, discussing. Um, so to treaties. Treaties are formal agreements. They're both bilateral, can be between two states only, but also many, and the UN Charter being an example is a multilateral treaty. Treaties are binding, the terms of treaties are binding on all states' parties to that treaty. However, it may develop this, the, the terms of the treaty may develop into universal customary law, which mean that it would be bind, which means that it would be binding on all states, even those states that may not have been participating in the negotiation of that treaty. Um, the role of treaties, the treaties can do a couple of things. Uh, one, they can codify what's already pre-existing customary law, but they also may have an important role in creating new law that's not based on pre-existing customary law. Customary international law. There are two elements and required elements of a customary international law. So when looking to decipher whether there is a customary law on a particular topic, um, the ICJ in a number of cases, I've just noted one of them here, the North Sea Continental Shelf, the court has told us what the court will look to in order to determine whether there is a customary law binding states on a topic. They will look to two elements, um, the state practice and opinio juris. Both elements are required. And looking to state practice, the nature of the practice itself, the court has explained through case uh, court decisions that the practice doesn't necessarily have to be universal, but it does have to be widespread practice among states. And while it doesn't necessarily have to be 100% consistent, every, every single state following that practice, there has to be a pretty widespread consistent practice by states. Um, it also includes those states that are especially affected by the issue. In other words, if there is a custom related to, uh, let's say, uh, nuclear weapons or fishery rights that is developed, the court will look to those states that would have an interest in it. So states that are not landlocked when it comes to fishery rights that have um, a coastline, that those states um, should be involved with the development of that custom. And that's what the court would look at to, to assess whether it is developed into a practice that supports customary law. And this custom and the practice itself would develop over time. There's some debate as to whether you can have instant custom. The majority of the court's decisions, though, show that they would look for the development over time of such practice. So they would look over a number of years, the exact number of years. Um, it's not a precise factor. Um, the evidence, what we would look to to find practice, the court has told us that there are official government conduct, official government statements also count as practice, as well as inaction or the acquiescence, if you will, of states can count as evidence of practice leading to the development of a customary law. And we'll come back to this. Um, we talk about the UNGG reports and the significance of them um, also for as far as the development of customary law, um, these are official, um, if they're speaking in official government capacity, uh, then they would count, they could be points of evidence of practice of states. The second required element though, of course, is opinio juris. This is the belief that the practice is legally obligatory. Um, without opinio juris, if you just have even widespread practice, um, there is not the ability to declare that it is law. 
So for instance, in the cyber, with respect to cyber activities, there are recent calls um, by states upon other states to come out publicly with statements of their view on how international law applies to cyber space and states actions within this zone of activity. And that would lend uh, the ability to look at not only the practice of states of what states are doing in cyberspace, but how they believe such practice is legally binding or not. And that would go to the, the opinio juris. Um, customary international law is binding on all states, as I mentioned, even states that may not have participated in its development. Now, the one exception here is that is there, if there is a developing customary law and a state objects to it, and yet the state must object to it in an express fashion, must repeatedly over the years object to this, that the, whatever provision of customary law that they do not agree with, and it must be public, then that state would have the status of persistent objector and may not be bound by that customary international law. Otherwise, all states um, will be bound by customary law, just as all states uh, that are signatories to treaties are bound by those law, that law. Um, now, customary law also, um, the role of custom is it may change pre-existing international law. So as time goes on, um, technologies develop, threats change, um, there is the ability that customary law develops that would actually change pre-existing. The example here I use is the, the treaty and the law of the sea, and prior uh, to the uh, treaty being ratified by many states, there's customary uh, practice in opinion juris related to the territorial sea and the measure of that. Um, that was a, a, a way that customary law actually had an impact of changing as the understanding of the um, 12 nautical mile limitation on the territorial sea, as it changed over time by states, that's an example how custom actually changed um, what pre-existing law had said. So non-binding instruments and actions, this is often referred to, and you may see people referring to this as soft law. Now these are not legally binding, um, and they can be in the form of agreements. Um, but even if they are, even though they are not legally binding, they may be very influential in, in developing international law itself. In other words, an example of the UN General Assembly resolutions um, that are at least those resolutions not related to the UN organizational matters, those resolutions related to organizational matters are binding. But um, the majority of resolutions are non-binding. How, however, they do have influence and importance because you have, particularly if it's a universally um, uh, accepted or unanimous resolution, um, it may contribute to the development of customary international law. So like UNGG reports and open-ended working group reports on ICTs, um, these diplomatic agreements, um, and although for the majority um, they're considered non-binding, um, they will have, an, they can and um, will likely have an impact on the development of customary law. Now to the principles of international law that I wanna cover uh, today. The first principle I wanna take up is um, briefly to get to move on is the principle of sovereignty. So um, the I see in the Island of Palmas case in 1928, um, the court gives us a definition of sovereignty as sovereignty in the relations between states signifies independence and independence in regard to a portion of the globe is the right to exercise therein to the exclusion of any other state, the functions of a state. So this um, concept and principle of sovereignty that all states have sovereign equality and individuality, it exposes itself in two elements. There's an external element of a state sovereignty, as well as an internal element. Um, and many, we will see the derivative principles that has actually stem from this fundamental principle of sovereignty. Um, so recent um, state claims uh, dealing with sovereignty and cyberspace, beginning in, as Dr. Lewis mentioned, uh, really we see in 2013, excuse me, in 13, with the UNGG report, states are coming out um, and identifying state sovereignty as something that they agree exists 
in the cyber domain or with respect to the conduct of ICT related activities. In 2015, again, the states observe um, that the principle of state sovereignty and st um, sovereign equality among states is relevant and applicable to cyberspace in the use of ICTs. And then recently with the open-ended working group report, again, you have a reference to state sovereignty. So starting in 2013, you see the states negotiating responsible state behavior at the UN, um, really bringing in the fundamental principles of international law um, into their discussions related to cyber activities. So in applying this principle of sovereignty under international law, I wanted to just give some examples of what has historically uh, been thought of as violations or, if you will, um, non-violations of this principle. So the act of propaganda, for instance, um, I often get questions from my students on this and in um, speaking at conferences, um, is not considered um, necessarily to be a violation of sovereignty. Now, it does come down to what kind of propaganda um, is involved. For instance, if it's propaganda that's advocating uh, the overthrow of a, a regime and violence, um, that would deemed, be deemed to be violative of the, pro, um, the state's sovereignty. But if it is propaganda that does not um, incite violence in war, it's not considered to be a violation of sovereignty. Um, at one time in history, um, even the criticism of another state's policies, and this really, uh, we saw historically quite a lot of this when it came to human rights. Um, some states um, used to argue that if one state criticizes it's right, uh, another state's activities when it comes to human rights policies, that that would violate the state's sovereignty. But it is widely um, accepted by international lawyers and others that criticizing another state's policies does not constitute a violation of sovereignty or, or international law. But some examples of violations of sovereignty would include unauthorized entry into a state's airspace and the exercise of enforcement jurisdiction absent the consent of the state in which you're operating in. There are some outstanding questions, though, related to cyber operations that I wanted to highlight. Um, there is still debate among states as to how this principle of sovereignty applies in cyber activities. Um, first question is, when do remote cyber operations violate a target state's territorial integrity? So there has been discussion um, within the academic community as well as to what threshold um, exists as to something that would in cyber domain would not violate versus violate. Um, the question that has been addressed by some governments, particularly the UK, um, is whether sovereignty is a general principle of international law a, um, or uh, is there a specific, a cyber specific rule of sovereignty that is completely separate from other legal uh, principles that we will talk about next, actually, for example, intervention. Now, um, the UK, uh, at least the, in 2018, the Attorney General of the UK, Jeremy Wright, did come out and publicly state that the position of the, um, uh, the UK is that there is no cyber specific rule of sovereignty that sovereignty is a recognized general principle of international law from which other principles um, and, and prohibitions are derived, such as the prohibition of intervention. Um, with that view or interpretation, there, are, there can be actions within cyberspace that would violate um, intervention, a separate rule. Um, and then there could be actions that do, do not violate intervention, um, but some may argue violate sovereignty. And this is where, so then there will be a debate as to whether sovereignty or any international law has been violated by certain cyber operations that um, operate within the territorial um, uh, area of another state. So to the derivative principles from sovereignty, um, accepting that sovereignty is a general principle fundamental to the, um, the rule-based society, um, at least since the Peace of Westphalia, you then have a number of more specific derivative principles that have developed from and based on the concept of sovereignty. Um, and we'll talk 
um, in more detail about each of these individually. Due diligence, and they have all come up in the context of cyber uh, operations as well. Due diligence has been defined as um, every state's obligation not to allow knowingly its territory to be used for acts contrary to the rights of other states. And, the, and knowingly, it can also be um, under the Corfu Channel case, the court had said that it would also be not only that you affirmatively knew, but that the state should have known. The second derivative um, principle is the prohibition on intervention. The prohibition on um, intervention is a particular uh, type of intervention that is prohibited. So not all intervention, but a prohibited intervention must accordingly be one bearing on matters in which each state is permitted by principle of state sovereignty to decide freely. And we're going to come back to that in the next slides. And then the third derivative principle that we'll cover is the prohibition on the use of force. This from the UN Charter Article 2.4. All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the UN. For state claims related to the first principle of due diligence, um, we have going back to the 2013 report, um, states have um, come to an agreement uh, that states should not seek to ensure should seek to ensure that their territories are not used by non-state actors for unlawful use of ICTs. Again, in 2015, states reiterated that agreement that the states should not allow um, any wrongful or internationally wrongful acts to be conducted from their territory. It's interesting that in 2015, the words internationally wrongful acts um, show up in the um, UNGG report because that is the phrase that's used in the um, International Law Commission's articles on state responsibility, which we will come to in just a minute. Um, and then recently in the second pre-draft of the Open-Ended Working Group report, it was reaffirmed that states must not use proxies to commit internationally wrongful acts um, using ICTs and should seek to ensure that their territory is not used by non-state actors to commit such acts. The second derivative principle from sovereignty, the principle of non-intervention. For this uh, rule of non-intervention, there are two elements um, of a wrongful intervention. As I mentioned, not all interventions in international uh, relations into another, um, into another state's domestic affairs is necessarily illegal. But the international um, customary principle of non-intervention has um, uh, made it illegal to conduct this type of intervention. And now there are two elements that must be met um, for a wrongful intervention. The first is what's referred to um, by the ICJ as the domain reserve. Um, mat matters the state is permitted to decide freely. So if a state is has the right to decide something free from any outside interference and another state actually intervenes and interferes with that those free decisions that would fall into the um uh, the element of domain reserve so examples are choice of a um, political economic social and cultural system within a country and in addition the formulation of foreign policy so states have um, a right to decide these issues freely. Um, specific examples, and this applies uh, whether in cyberspace or otherwise, an interference into an election of a country would be a wrongful intervention um, because holding elections and choice of elections would be a matter that is reserved um, under as a domain reserve for a state to freely decide. Other specific examples is any interference in choice of language, um, structure of government, recognition, the act of recognition of another government or another state, and terms of treaties. These are all areas where a state freely decides and no other state could intervene or interfere. The second required element though, this element of coercion tends to be the more controversial, harder to decide, um, and that is coercion. These are acts that would deprive a state of the freedom of choice, either causing a state to act in a way it otherwise wouldn't or refraining from acting in a, in a way it, it would otherwise act. Okay, and I'm looking at my timer. I wanna try to um, 
get through these. Um, not, not as I've already said, not all interference, um, and I'm sorry for the typos, um, in a state's affairs is unlawful. Examples of what would not be unlawful, but persuasion or criticism, uh, criticism and other, other states' policies, fake news, um, and then examples that would constitute unlawful interventions, the hacking into a state's election process in order to alter the votes or the election outcome, and all uses of force. These are all, um, all uses of force are unlawful interventions. A third and the final derivative uh, principle come, stemming from sovereignty is the principle of non-use of force. Um, un under Article 2.4 uh, of the UN Charter, the definition is all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. Now, there is debate and has been since 1945 when the provision was put in the charter as to the definition of a use of force. Now, clearly the provision tells you what a use of force is. You're, and I'll go back for a moment. It's the um, threat or use of force against territorial integrity and political independence of any state. So therefore, the members that were negotiating this treaty, they weren't prohibiting all uses of force. They were prohibiting, prohibiting um, uses of force that go against territorial integrity and political independence of a state. However, um, the exact definition, okay, I'm trying to, the exact definition, there is no complete specific definition um, inside with related to cyber activities or even um, non-cyber. But what we do know from the negotiating history is that this prohibition does not include economic or political coercion. Now, there are three exceptions um, to the prohibition on the use of force. Force can be authorized by the UN Security Council, force taken in self-defense in response to an armed attack, Article 51, and consent, of course, by another state. There is a distinction between a use of force and an armed attack. The Nicaragua case identified that distinction, so not all uses of force would be an armed attack. The importance of this is that if you do suffer an armed attack, if it reaches this level, uh, the course that the victim state has the right to use force in self-defense, um, but as meant uh, by the charter. Now, if it's not an armed attack, but a use of force, then you don't have the Article 51 authority to use force in self-defense. But we will get to, if I can speed up a bit, some of the um, remedies, if you will, of victim states uh, that are victims of a use of force in cyber or outside. So when a state determines, is trying to determine whether something has reached the threshold of a use of force, it is very case specific and fact dependent. Um, you would look according to the court, um, the nature and severity of the harm would be key to determining. And that the court has also um, indicated that it is beyond just de minimis uses of force. And here I give some general examples, um, arming and training of guerrilla forces. So an indirect use of force is possible. That would constitute a use of force. There is There are remaining debates as to whether a state that is providing sanctuary um, to non-state actors who are using force against another state, whether that rises to the level of a use of force for that that state can be held responsible for. Okay, uh, cyber uh, operations examples. Um, I tried to give some concrete examples where there is agreement. Um, there is a, a lot of lack of agreement on certain specific examples of operations, but there is general agreement that if you have a cyber operation that causes similar effects and the international law, modern international law, um, has looked at the effects of a state's activity uh, when it's determining whether some action is lawful or not. Um, and so here, if in a non-cyber action, if it is a, a use of force, but a cyber action carries out the same kind of effect, generally it's agreed to that this would be a use of force for cyber action as well. And, and typically it's death, injury, uh, destruction, and damage. I give some examples of some very cyber specific operations that are still uh, debated today as to whether they reach that threshold. So denial of service operations against IOT devices or a state that's just financing. So they ne may not be actually um, ar arming or training, but if they're giving funding, um, does that um, to a non-state actor, does that amount 
to a use of force. For some recent state claims, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the 2015 um, GG report identifies the issue of the uh, refraining from the international relations from the threat of use of force. And the May 2020 UNGG report, interestingly enough, highlights the fact that we need more clarity because there are questions among the states as to what would amount to a use of force and what would amount to an armed attack that would trigger self-defense. As uh, Dr. Lewis had said, the members are still uh, not in complete agreement. Now, here is the heart of um, what we uh, many of us want to talk about, general principles of state responsibility. This stems from customary international law. There is no treaty. The International Law Commission did come out successfully in 2001 with the Articles on Responsibility of States for Internationally Wrongful Acts. It was significant, and this effort for this group of international law experts went over, believe it or not, about a century of effort to codify what are uh, the rules related to responsibilities of, um, of states. So finally, they did it in 2001. And yes, the UN General Assembly did not vote on this to be a treaty. However, and importantly, um, this uh, many provisions of these articles have been accepted as customary international law. And this is why the remainder of my slides are dealing with the provisions of these rules. Um, the definition, it becomes important first and foremost that you have a state, and we'll get to attribution, that has been attributed to conducting an act or an omission that breaches an international obligation. So it has to be an international legal obligation in, which, in order for something to be an international uh, wrongful, internationally wrongful act. All right, I'm trying to fast forward here. Um, if, the breach, if the breach results in an injury, the injury is of another state. That's another requirement in terms of its, um, uh, the injury. And I don't know why I just lost my slides on my phone. All right, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off my, okay, I think I got him back. I don't know why it's, okay, I'm going to keep talking because I can't get my um, slides to come back. So let me just, um, sorry, everyone, I'm using my, Okay, I think I got it back. Um, so the definition, um, you both have, you have to have a state, it has to be a wrongful act under international law that it's committed, it's got to be attributed. So the nature of the responsibility, as I've said, international law is violated, that can be either treaty or custom, the breach can be their actions or omissions, there has to be an injury to a state, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be damage that's required, just an injury. And then the breach has to be attributed to the state in order to hold that state responsible. Now, generally, the language of the ILC, they talked about these rule as, rules as secondary rules. Th this is not very important. For academics, it's very important. But it's saying that these are not primary rules like a use of force. They're secondary rules in the sense they're telling you what a victim state can do if there has been a breach of an obligation. And that does become important for us. I'm going to skip over remedies um, uh, right now because I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm also going to, this is a statement, a claim by the um, open-ended working group on um, state responsibility, internationally wrongful acts. Rules of attribution. First, you need to attribute the wrongful act um, to a state. Um, and that can be acts or omissions. The conduct is automatically can be attributed. Now, Dr. Lewis talked about what I would call technical attribution. And here under international law, this is legal attribution. Now, clearly attribution involves evidence, technical, it involves policy decisions, but this is what the law tells us attribution is about. The conduct that can be attributed to state organs. So if any part of a government um, whether it's intelligence, uh, whether it's law enforcement, if they conduct a wrongful act, um, even if it's ultra virus, meaning even if they conducted the act and it wasn't under their specific authority to do that, that act is going to be attributed to the state and the state can be held responsible. Also, if you can, um, the, the government contracts individuals or private companies, um, that act, those acts of those companies hired by the government can be attributed to the government. However, 
unlike um, government um, officials or employees, ultra virus acts of um, of individuals hired by the government, but done these are acts done in their private capacity are not attributable to the government. Now, importantly, even conduct that the state may not have conducted itself or authorized or directed the conducting of, but after the fact accepts it, acknowledges it and, adopt, and adopts it, the state is gonna be held responsible. So this is ex post facto attribution. Okay, um, there is, and I'll say this, I, I leave this alone on the screen because there's been some debate about this in the cyber context. Under inter current international law, there is no requirement to make evidence that is the basis of attribution publicly available. However, and it is a big however, if a state takes action, attributes activity to a state, holding the other state responsible for a breach of international obligations against it, and then takes action, it may be that, an in, depending on what the action is, it may be that an international court that has jurisdiction will decide whether the attribution was made properly and, and rendering it the court's decision on the legality of the state's action. So it is important to get your attribution correct, but it does not necessarily have to be publicly shared. All right, I'm trying to, um, uh, my slides again are kind of, okay. Um, I skipped over one. It was a, a report on the 2015 state claim. Here's a, a big question that still remains. This is third party standing. So if a state is not necessarily suffered the injury, the, a specific state, can that non-injured state um, take action against a, this, the, the breaching state that have that breach an obligation owed to another state? According to the International Law Commission articles, their answer was yes. And under two cases, um, obligation owed, if that obligation that's breached by the wrongful acting state is an obligation owed to a group of states, including the state that's taken the action, that would be called a collective obligation, or the obligation is owed to the entire international community. This has been of an inter in the International Law Commission, this was a great debate when they drafted the articles. It still remains a, a debate. The, the, commis the commission left this open. It has become an issue for cyber operations when we talk about collective countermeasures. With, and, and also, when I talk about ergo omnis, it's these are uh, rights or interests such as the freedom, um, the things that they're trying to prohibit and is a community uh, right is uh, acts of genocide, aggression, racial discrimination. Um, these are the kinds of collective um, uh, obligations that everyone has. But I'll come back to that when I come to countermeasures. Now, uh, very quickly, circumstances precluding wrongfulness. This becomes important for a lot of the cyber responses, if you will, holding states accountable. The list of specific circumstances, I will, in my slides, I cover the first four, and I know I'm running out of time. These are circumstances where and take, a state takes an action, which would traditionally be considered wrongful, meaning illegal, but because it's, it's a specific action and it's done in response, to another state breaching an obligation owed to it, that act, that wrongful action is precluded. I mean, it, it, it is not considered, in other words, um, technically unlawful. It is justified. So even though it's unlawful. So here we will move on. I will quickly skip over consent, although it's important. Um, it's kind of one of the easier concepts and not of much controversy, but I'll go to countermeasures. So if a state is um, been the victim of a breach of an obligation owed to it. They can take countermeasures, including in cyberspace. Now, this has been controversial in 2017. The group of government experts did not get agreement and did not put into the report because there was lack of agreement on whether countermeasures were applicable in cyberspace. But outside of cyberspace, according to the Articles of State Responsibility, um, self, these are self help help actions that are unlawful, but taken by an injured state targeting a state that is responsible for a breach of an international obligation owed to it in order to get the offending state to comply with its obligations. So these would otherwise be unlawful actions, but because they're taken in this manner, they would be uh, justified, if you will. 
there were a lot of rules and I would, it's interesting, countermeasures of all the issues, the articles of state responsibility went over, countermeasures was the most controversial. It, it, it followed the most discussion, debates and disagreements, but what the articles ended up um, being accepted as, they had to be specific in terms of the purpose, it can't be retaliatory, cannot be escalatory. It has to be focused only on uh, making or uh, inducing a state to uh, comply with its obligations. As I said, there's controversy in 2017 at the UNGG states didn't um, uh, come to an agreement. There is a list of both substantive uh, limitations and procedural conditions that the articles have put on countermeasures. And this is the list of them. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go over all of them. These are very interesting to discuss. I can, I'd be happy if we have time for questions to go over them, but they are constrained. Um, there are also allowances in cyber. You, if you're doing a cyber countermeasures, for instance, you don't have to conduct the countermeasure that's in like kind to the wrongful act. There's no requirement to target a facility of the state that's the wrongful acting state. You can target a private company through a cyber countermeasure as long as your goal is to get it's directed towards the responsible state. Um, but your target can actually be an individual or private company. Um, collective countermeasures. The ILC left collective countermeasures to be they did not um, come one way or the other on this issue. They left it to be determined later on with the development of law in this area. Um, so personally, what I've said, based on um, the principle, the Lotus case principle, that when something is not regulated, that this would be allowable in um, in today's world. So that, and to me, it makes sense. If you have the right of collective self-defense, which we really haven't had a chance to get to, it was the next one, um, then you should have the right of collective um, countermeasures w within those limits. Um, I then would have talked about self-defense. Uh, we just mentioned it briefly about the different thresholds, how you look to see if an armed attack occurs. Um, it's applicable in cyberspace, generally accepted, although we saw some disagreement among the UNGG members. Um, and then there's also the customary principles, which are critically important, necessity, proportionality. And the last, very last um, principle is principle of necessity, plea of, and I think the plea of necessity, and I think I am completely out of time. Sorry, Heli. I tried to talk fast. I do want to leave. Can I leave with one last slide? The last slide is the future. Um, and it comes from the words of the open-ended working group. I'm trying to get my slide up there. Um, well, I'll read it to you. Um, in order for all states to develop, that's it. Uh, this is from the words of uh, the open-ended working group. Of course, as an international lawyer, I like the last part. Um, that we need additional efforts to build capacity in the area of international law and national legislation and policy. And of course, that's what Heli is trying to do. That's what this class is trying to do. So I welcome the class. I thank you for your time. And I'm sorry I talked. It was so long. Thank you so much, Katrin. I think we need to do more of those virtual classes in the future and maybe specific ones on, on the issues of, of international law. And um, thank you for uh, going through the basic concepts. I think um, all of us have heard some of those, but uh, not uh, all of us understand how those concepts are relating to each other. So I think uh, your lecture was really, truly enriching. Thank you, Katrin. And our next lecturer will be Dr. Kubo Machak, who is the legal advisor in the ICRC's legal division, uh, assigned jointly to the thematic unit uh, and the commentaries unit. Prior to joining the ICRC in October 2019, he worked as an associate professor at the University of Exeter. In that position, Kubo taught and researched in the areas of public international law, international humanitarian law, and international cyber law. He's the author of the book, Internationalized Armed Conflicts in International Law, and uh, author of multiple articles. Kubo is also the general editor of the Cyber Law Toolkit, uh, which is an interactive online resource on the international law of cyber operations. He holds a doctorate in international law from the University of Oxford, and undergraduate degree from the University of Prague. 
So, Kuba, the floor is yours, and you will cover the uh, international humanitarian law, as I understand. Please. Uh, thank you, Heli. That's absolutely right. Uh, I will talk about international humanitarian law in cyberspace. So greetings to everyone who is joining us today. Greetings from a sunny Geneva. It's, as you can see, it's a very warm day in Geneva today, so I apologize for not uh, wearing a jacket. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, the current situation that we see around us in the world obviously has many poses many disadvantages, poses many obstacles, but we have also seen a lot of innovation. And I think today's event is one such example of uh, having a really, truly inclusive conversation. And on behalf of the International Committee of the Red Cross, it is a true privilege and honor to join this, uh, uh, the ranks of uh, my previous speakers and those who will follow. So, as many of our viewers will know, the mandate of the organization that I represent is to act as the guardian and promoter of international humanitarian law. So, obviously, the application of international humanitarian law in all contexts is a very important issue to us. And thus, we are very grateful to the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the invitation. And we're also grateful to our listeners and viewers for tuning in. So without further ado, let me start with the presentation. So perhaps the good a good way of starting it would be to look at the, uh, the definition of the terms that we're going to use. So IHL is sometimes referred to also as LOAC, in other words, the law of armed conflict, or in Latin as used in bello. It is very important to say that when we talk about international humanitarian law, we are not talking about the use ad bellum, but uh, luckily we had uh, um, Catherine's lecture, which has uh, explained the basic concepts of the use ad bellum. So let me just very quickly reiterate, perhaps for, for those viewers who are just joining now. When we talk about the use ad bellum, we use the vocabulary of just war, unjust war. We use the vocabulary of aggressors and aggressor state and victim states. And the key sources here are the United Nations Charter and customer international law. So in other words, use ad bellum tells us when is it permissible for states to use force in their international relations? Now, use in bello, which will be the focus of my lecture, on the other hand, is a little bit more technical, it uses little less loaded terms to describe what it is about. So it speaks about a situation of an armed conflict. It talks about belligerent parties, and the key sources for uh, IHL are the Geneva Conventions, additional protocols, and again, the customary international humanitarian law. So this difference between the two is uh, in that IHL tells us what are the rules that apply when there is already an ongoing situation of an armed conflict. And so we need to, to, to maintain a strict separation between these two concepts. And I'm going to focus on the latter in the remainder, in the remainder of my talk. Now, what do we talk about when we mention cyber operations during armed conflicts? So the ICRC definition is that this notion of cyber operations refers to those operations that are led either against a computer, against a network, or a computer system, any other connected device, when such operations are used as methods and means of warfare in the context of an armed conflict. So we have to keep all of those aspects in mind. We are in a situation of an armed conflict, and then there are some operations that are using this modern technology as means and methods of warfare. That's when we talk about the older term is cyber warfare, but we prefer cyber operations during armed conflict. Now, the ICRC approach in this regard is threefold. You could say it's one, technology oriented, Right, So we focus on the developments of the technology and we try to understand how that is uh, evolving. Number two, it is human centric. So in other words, we are concerned about what is the potential human cost of cyber operations. And then number three, because we are lawyers in the legal division at the ICRC, it is focused on the law as well. And so in other words, we work in line with our mandate, which is to be the guardian and promoter of IHL, we work with respect to clarification and development of this body of law. So with definitions out of the way, what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of the talk are three big questions. Okay, when we say big, then different ways. So uh, the first one, the threshold question, asks whether IHL applies to cyber operation. I would put it to you that this is perhaps a question that has vexed states to some extent, but it is perhaps slightly easier to answer, as hopefully we will see. Then the other two, 
which by contrast are big in the sense that they are controversial, they are difficult and complex questions, which do not yet have result, fully resolved answers. And so those are number two, the weapons questions. So I'm going to talk about one specific IHO obligation, and that is the weapons review obligation. And I'm going to look at how it applies to cyber capabilities. And then finally, I'll talk about the data question, which is about how IHL rules on targeting apply to cyber operations against data. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the threshold question. Uh, or maybe even before we start with the threshold question, allow me to still say a little, a few words about the selection of these topics. So the first one, the threshold question is, uh, we need to choose it. It's an, it's an obvious choice because it tells us uh, without answering the threshold question, without knowing that IHL applies to cyber operation, uh, to cyber operations, we cannot proceed to other questions, how specifically it applies. So in, in, that's why it's a threshold question. It's a baseline question, which we need to get out of the way first. Otherwise, everything else uh, remains irrelevant. Relevant. But about the two remaining ones, we draw exactly on the Cyber Law Toolkit project, which is the project that Heli kindly mentioned in the beginning. And in the context of this project, uh, the ICRC and four additional partners that include academic deemed into other international organizations uh, and uh, and national uh, cyber and one national cybersecurity agency we have got together a group of experts government and military uh, legal practitioners and cyber operators and we asked them what are the current issues what are the current problems that they are facing when it comes to peacetime situations such as those that Catherine has just spoken about but also when it comes to situations of armed conflict and it was precisely in the context of this project of this project that two such issues were clearly identified by the experts and those are the so-called weapons and the data question so it's not just an arbitrary choice on our part but it's something that came from this iterative discussion of experts in the context of our project so now with uh, the justification out of the way let's tr let's now truly start with the first one with the threshold question so in other words here we're asking does ihl apply at all to cyber operations now, we have heard this several times today, cyberspace is not, as a, one uh, older quote would suggest, the wild, wild west. States have many times affirmed that international law applies to cyberspace, uh, and in particular, of course, the Charter of the United Nations, which represents the use ad bellum body that uh, we have mentioned in the beginning. And so this has now become a, a part of this repeated consensus of states. In 2013, it was expressed by the UN Group of Governmental Experts experts, but that uh, statement has later been endorsed by a unanimous resolution of the UN General Assembly. And uh, if we fast forward, these are just two examples, let's say, from the start and from the beginning, or from the start of the process and just the most recent one that I could find. So that's the pre-draft of the UN open-ended working group uses almost the same language. Existing obligations under international law applicable to state use of ICTs, which is the code language for uh, operations in cyber space. So, but the question remains, does that also apply to international humanitarian law? In other words, we say that international law applies, but does that apply to all of its uh, constituent bodies? Now, the easy answer would be, you might be thinking, well, if we started out by saying that IHL is a part of international law, then if international law as a whole applies, then surely all of its constituent parts must apply as well. So as we lawyers like to say, a maiori ad minus, if the greater applies, then the smaller should apply as well. But it turns out, as also my uh, predecessors have mentioned, that this is a question that has generated some controversy among the states. So let's have a look at what happened and why this has generated such controversy. So, in other words, it's useful to revisit again the, the timeline of these UN-based processes with the UNGGE, where in the 2013 report, we have seen a state consensus that international law in general applies in cyberspace. And then in 2015, a very important reference to principles of proportionality, distinction, necessity. And so these are principles that we recognize as principles of IHL. So it is an IHL language, which to many of us at that time, I was an academic, 
so speaking now uh, as, as a former academic, to many of us observers of these processes, it seemed to indicate that states are headed towards a clear acknowledgement that IHL is applicable in cyberspace as well. But then that process came to a halt in 2017. And of course, as we have heard, now we have two new processes. I have referred to the, the outputs of both of them, and we will hear uh, uh, certainly much more about them uh, in the remainder of today as well. But if we zoom in on the 2017 point, the point at which states failed to reach, an, uh, reach a consensus, it's interesting to analyze what were the reasons for that? What were the fault lines? And so reportedly, the reasons for the breakdown of consensus included several of the topics that we have talked about today. So number one, the issue of countermeasures, when states are allowed to respond to internationally wrongful acts under international law. Secondly, the right to save self-defense, so again, a part of the use ad bellum. But very importantly, for the purposes of this section of today, international humanitarian law. And then if we are to believe, because of course these discussions were uh, held behind closed doors, but if we are to, to believe the, the, the reasons that were uh, alluded to at the time, the key objections against the inclusion of IHL into the 2017 report that never came out were threefold. Number one, the absence of state practice. Number two, an argument that we need new rules. And number three, the argument about militarization of cyberspace. Now, the, the first of the three, the argument with the absence of state practice, if it ever was true, it probably is the time to, to put it to rest. We, according to various studies, we see around 100 states around the world developing military cyber capabilities. There are several states that have openly acknowledged having used such military cyber capabilities in time of armed conflict. So it is certainly not just science fiction that cyber operations can take place during armed conflicts. Then secondly, the argument that, oh, maybe we have this body of IHL, but actually cyber is so new that we need a new body of rules. Well, this is an interesting argument. It didn't stop states in the other areas of international law. And so it doesn't carry that much valence also in the area of IHL. Surely there might be some rules that are new, that are needed in, in the present time, but we have to start by acknowledging that there is already an existing body of law and see how that body of law applies to existing situations. So perhaps the most convincing and the most worrying of the three arguments is the argument from militarization of cyberspace. And to, to give it justice, the, the argument goes something like this. If, uh, if we were to acknowledge that the law of armed conflict, as IHL is also sometimes referred to, if we were to acknowledge that IHL applies to, to military cyber operations, that would encourage states to engage in such operations. And in other words, that would legitimize uh, cyber warfare and that would militarize uh, uh, cyberspace domain. So it's, it's, it's compelling, it's un the, the moral sentiment that underlies it, it is uh, understandable, but I would argue that if we put it under scrutiny, it doesn't hold water. So let's have a look at it in a little bit more detail. So my main answer, when we look at the question of militarization of cyber, of alleged militarization of cyberspace, the main answer is that we need to distinguish between regulation on the one hand and justification on the other. So in the first instance, at the first level, this is almost the philosophical point. If we acknowledge that law governs a certain type of conduct, what we are doing is not legitimating that conduct, we are simply regulating that conduct. So to give you a very clear example, if you finish listening to, this, to these talks today, you will walk outside of your house and you have a road there and you're deciding whether or not to cross it, you look at the lights and the light is red, you see that there is a clear rule that regulates whether or not you're allowed to cross the road. Now. To say that traffic rules govern our conduct when we are participants in traffic, to say that that somehow legitimates violating these rules wouldn't make much sense. If we acknowledge that uh, traffic rules govern our conduct, what we are saying is there are some rules that we as participants in traffic, whether as pedestrians, whether as cars, simply have to abide by. So what the law does, is it contains the choice that we have, the choice in the conduct that we have to a certain set of this conduct, which is permissible by the law. 
So that's the philosophical point. But then moving on to the second point, IHL in its nature as a body of law is a restrictive body of law. And we know this because we have had international case law. So in the post Nuremberg trials, uh, it was held by uh, one of these uh, uh, one of these tribunals in the US and list case that IHL is prohibitive law. And we have also had a number of scholars who have taken that view that IHL is here to forbid, not to authorize manifestations of force. And in the third, you know, if you're still not convinced and if you're still hesitating, in the third instance, there is the important distinction of use ad bellum and use in bello, with which we have actually started this lecture. And in the use ad bellum, we have a clear general prohibition on the use of force, which is embodied in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. So there is a prohibition for states to engage in conduct that amounts to the use of armed force. IHL only comes after that prohibition has been violated by one or more states. And IHL is there to regulate the armed conflict when, as a matter of fact, that armed conflict has started taking place. In other words, use in bello is agnostic on the legality or on the legitimacy of a particular armed conflict, which is a fact that states have recognized when they agreed on the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, because this is reflected in the preamble to that treaty. So, in summary, on the first question, the ICRC view is, and it is also my personal view, that IHL is applicable to cyber operations during armed conflicts. So, in other words, what this means is that if states do use cyber capabilities during armed conflicts, then IHL constrains them in the choice of behavior that is available to them. Secondly, IHL protects civilians and civilian objects, but IHL does not legitimize cyber warfare nor does it militarize cyberspace. So that's the answer to the threshold question, which then brings us to many other, it could be a myriad questions that we, would, uh, that we could have a look at, but out of constraints for time, I'm going to look at two specific ones. So the question then becomes, with the threshold one out of the way, the question becomes, how do specific rules apply to cyber operations? And we're going to have a look at two, and we're going to start with, right now, with the weapons question. And so the weapon, weapons question concerns, or it could be extended to ask, how does the weapons review obligation apply to cyber capabilities? Now, we have said that IHL in principle is here for situations of armed conflict, but that doesn't mean that all of its rules only apply in situations of armed conflict. There are some rules of IHL that also apply in peacetime. Just a very clear example that everybody will be familiar with, when uh, Again, in a very domestic situation, you go outside and you see the emblem of the Red Cross or the Red Crescent, depending on which country you are in. That is the distinctive emblem, which is protected by the Geneva Conventions. So the international law bestows upon this emblem comes from IHL. But of course, states have to adopt legislation that protects this distinctive emblem already in times of peace. But the one that I want to focus on is a different one. I don't want to talk about the distinctive emblems. I want to talk about the one that you see at the very bottom of the slide, which is the duty to review the legality of new weapons, means, and methods of warfare. This is a duty that's embodied or enshrined in Article 30 of the first additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions. Now, the extent to which this rule applies to states differ differs on the basis of their uh, on. on, on on the basis of several considerations. So number one, for states who are states parties to the first additional protocol, the obligation is the most extensive and it obliges them to always determine whether the employment of a new weapon means or method of warfare that they are either studying, developing, acquiring or adopting would be in some circumstances prohibited by international law. So that's a very extensive uh, obligation that applies to about 60, 170 states who have ratified the first additional protocol. Now, in the ICRC's view, the obligation to conduct legal review of new weapons also flows from the duty to ensure respect for IHL under Common Article 1. And Common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions is binding on all states. So uh, in the ICRC's view, that's an obligation for all states. But even for states who are in the small group of states who haven't ratified the additional protocol and who disagree with this view, there are practical considerations which lead them to understand that these reviews are very important because 
simply speak, they need to ensure that the weapons that they use would in practice be used in compliance with existing law, including IHL, and so very pragmatically that then pr prevents the very costly consequences of approving and procuring some weapon, doesn't have to be a cyber weapon, just a weapon in general, which then would not be able to be used lawfully. So the, that's the weapons review obligation. Is a, it's a very important obligation under the law of armed conflict or under IHL. And if we can move to the next slide, let's have a look how it could apply to a hypothetical situation in time of uh, or in relation to cyber capabilities. So let's now imagine, and this is not a pure hypothetical because we already have robots that can repair jet engines. So let's imagine that the state develops a new malware that is designed to cause physical damage to enemy military equipment by, mani by manipulating the maintenance process. So in other words, what this malware does, it spreads throughout the internet, throughout the networks to reach the target system in which it identifies what we call a PLC, a programmable logical component of that system. If it identifies the right PLC, it knows that it has reached the target system, it will change the way that this robotic maintenance software works. And so instead of the robot repairing a military equipment, it will slightly damage it. the equipment of the enemy cannot be used in practice. So that's a hypothetical. Let's use this hypothetical to understand how the weapons review obligation would apply in practice. So the first question and the very key question then becomes, is this actually a cyber weapon? And we run into the problems here because we don't have a generally accepted definition of what cyber weapon is, but we could, as a, as a way of a possible argument, proceed as follows. Weapons are what are, are instruments that are being used in attacks. The notion of attack is defined by the law. We have the definition in Article 49 of the first additional protocol. So an attack is something that is an act of violence against the adversary. And we also know that the notion of violence, although it's controversial how far that notion extends, but we know that at the very minimum, it entails injury, death, damage, or destruction. So thus we can make the next logical step, and this has been done by authors of several of uh, manuals uh, on, on the at the international level, but also domestically, which is to define weapons as those instruments that are capable of causing such consequences, so that are capable of causing injury or death or damage or destruction. So if you follow that syllogism to its end, I would say that it, it follows logically, this argument could be seen as leading to the conclusion that such malware that causes physical damage, as in our example, we physically damage the, uh, the, the, the engine or the military equipment on the other side, could be interpreted to qualify as a weapon under IHL. So now, if we accept this argument that this could be qualified as a weapon, then in the next step, the question becomes, how do we assess this against the applicable uh, uh, rules of IHL? So the first question in the re legal review uh, process is always, does the weapon violate any express prohibition on its use? And now we can take this uh, step out of the way very easily because as we have heard several times, we just simply don't have a, a general uh, treaty that would regulate the use of cyber, cyber capabilities. We have rules against the use of chemical, biological weapons or anti-personal landmines and other forms of military equipment but we don't have a prohibition with their capabilities. So in the second step, we have to have a look whether the weapon violates any of the generally applicable rules. And there are two that are usually highlighted as the key ones in this regard. The first one is the prohibition of means of warfare that are of a nature to cause superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering. Now, this is likely inapplicable here because we are talking about an example, as we have said, that causes damage to objects, but that doesn't cause injury to persons. So we can take uh, that concrete uh, step out or that concrete uh, prohibition out of the way. Now, the second one uh, is more uh, important, and that's the prohibition of means of warfare that are by nature indiscriminate. So in other words, if this malware was designed in such a way that it would not distinguish between and military infrastructure and it could cause damage to all without distinction, then it wouldn't pass this step because it would be by nature indiscriminate. So whether or not a new cyber capability passes this step will depend on the nature and on the extent of the effects that it has on the civilian infrastructure. So it is, in other words, theoretically possible that such a cyber capability could be employed in a way that would comply with international humanitarian law.
But then you might ask, well, but what if it gets out of hand? And so the, uh, the, the man that we see on the picture on the left is not simply a meme of a, a, a guy uh, not being certain about what happens, but to people active in cybersecurity, uh, this is someone who is very well known uh, and uh, it's he's called Mr. Marcus Hutchins, based in uh, Devon in England, which is very close to where I used to work at the University of Exeter. And he is very well known because he discovered a kill switch that stopped the the spread of the WannaCry ransomware in 2017. So that's uh, the screenshot that you see on the right. It was something you really didn't want to see on your screen uh, back then. It's a ransomware that caused a lot of uh, disruption around the world, including to the NHS in the United Kingdom. But uh, what uh, the example of Marcus Hutchins and the WannaCry incident shows to us is the importance of, of being able to constrain or to control the cyber tool in time and in space. There are various tools that can be used to do that and thus to minimize the effect on, the, on, the, on civilian cyber infrastructure. But one of such tools, the kill switch. So uh, in other words, uh, a utility or a tool that can be used by uh, the operator to stop the spread of malware in real time, which is exactly what happened in the context of the WannaCry ransomware in 2017. So I'm going to uh, wrap up the discussion of the second question, which relates to the, the weapons or when can we consider cyber capabilities as qualifying as weapons? And then what are the constraints that IHL imposes on such capabilities? And let's have a look at the final question, which is the data question. And so in this part, I'm going to talk about how rules on targeting apply to cyber operations against data. Now, most of our listeners and actually viewers, because you need to see this image, if you look at the, 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 the image you see on the screen, you probably don't need to hesitate too long. You can distinguish between these two very easily. We see a, a group of children on the left, so civili clearly civilians who are protected by IHL. And then on the right-hand side, well, we don't know if these persons qualify as uh, someone who is directly participating in hostilities or as combatants, but to the extent that these persons take an active part in, in the hostilities, Utilities, they would not be protected by IHL. So that's a very important distinction. And the way that the law formulates yeah, uh, is uh, uh, the following, and we see it in Article 48 of the first additional protocol, which says that uh, the parties to armed conflicts must at all times distinguish between when it comes to persons, on the one hand, civilian population, and on the other hand, combatants, and when it comes to objects between civilian objects and military objectives. So in uh, the physical world, this doesn't pose, of course, there are discussions that uh, can be uh, had uh, around the nuances of these terms, but by and large, this doesn't pose too much too many problems, because when we look at an image like the one you see right now, which is a satellite image that uh, was used in the context of uh, a previous armed conflict, uh, we see the distinction between military revetments, so military barricades, which uh, in normal circumstances, due to their nature, would qualify as military objectives. And then a school, which again, in normal circumstances, when uh, it, it is uh, full of children or even when it is empty, it is a civilian object that is protected by the law. And the way that the law is this, uh, so how do we find out whether something, some specific thing in, a, in, in, in the physical space is protected by the law is the following. and we we see this definition in Article 52, Paragraph 2 of the First Additional Protocol, which mandates that attacks shall, shall be limited strictly to military objectives. In other words, civilian objects must never be the object of attack. And then it continues by saying, insofar as objects are concerned, and this is a very important part, insofar as objects are concerned, military objectives are limited to those objects which make an effective contribution to military action and whose destruction or other forms of uh, disruption like capture or neutralization would offer a definite military advantage. But the key bit is the word objects, right? So in the definition, we see that in order to find out whether something is a military objective, it must first be an object, and then we look at whether it meets the criteria that are specified by Article 52 in great detail. So, 
so in the context of cyber operations, now let's imagine a further hypothetical to illustrate the problem of targeting of data. So this is Bob, let's call him Bob. Uh, and Bob works at a central registry office of one state that is unfortunately involved in an armed conflict against another state. And now Bob doesn't know it yet, but he is about to have a problem because even though his office where he works, the central registry office, is only maintaining civilian data, data on census taking, on social benefits, on voting, on taxation, even, even though this is the purpose of uh, his employer, the state with which his state is in a situation of an armed conflict decides to launch a cyber operation against this office. And so the operation is successful and what happens is that it destroys all the data that is held by the registry office. So the data is now deleted, but Bob actually doesn't know it yet because when he looks around himself, the servers that uh, are surrounding him, the computers, the cables, even the screen of his own computer from which he is monitoring what's happening might not show any, uh, any change. And there is certainly no physical damage to speak of. There is no smoke coming out of any of the equipment. There is no fire. And uh, the only effect is in cyberspace, is on these virtual things, and I'm intentionally using this uh, generic term because we are about to run into a problem, and these things are data. So the only effect is on data. Now, the question for you to think about is, does this actually amount to a violation of IHL? Now, there is no question that if state X decided to bomb the central registry office or to set it on fire or to otherwise attack it kinetically, that would be a violation of IHL and under most circumstances, a war crime. But is this also a violation of IHL when the effect is limited to cyberspace? Now, it turns out that uh, there are two main approaches and this is, as I said, it's an open question, which is the subject of controversy among scholars and among states. And what it really comes down to is whether we define data as an object or whether we conceptualize this data as an object in the sense that IHL gives it. So the first approach is that IHL is not an object and thus it is not covered by the rules on targeting unless the operation in question somehow affects the tangible components of the cyber infrastructure. So yes, if the, if the computer stopped working, then even under this approach, the operation would still be subject to the rules of IHL and it could also only be uh, performed if it was targeted at a military objective. But we have said in our scenario that that's not the case. We have said that the only effect is on data itself in the central registry office. So then there is the second approach, which says that data is an object, and so if we accept that data is an object, then of course the operation against it, which results in its destruction, erasure, or alteration, must comply with the requirements of IHL. So this is something that uh, has vexed uh, academics for quite some time, and uh, I have also had the pleasure of participating in that debate, but I'm going to try to summarize the views very ob as objectively as I can. So those who are in the no camp, who answer data is not an object, focus on the ordinary meaning of the term object. And they would say that data is not visible and tangible. It's not as visible and tangible as the computers that surrounded Bob in the previous picture, or maybe as the chair that he was sitting on. And thus, it is not something that at the time when the rules on targeting that are now enshrined in, Artic in Article 52.2 of the 1977 additional protocol, so it is not something that the drafters could have been thinking of in the 70s. Of course, the no camp has offers a fallback solution, which is that if cyber infrastructure is affected, so if these tangible things are somehow affected, then the cyber operation in question qualifies as an attack and thus it will fall within IHL. So this is not to say that the no camp removes all of the operations against data from the purview of IHL. No, but those operations that do not target, that do not affect the infrastructure itself, those would be outside of the remit of IHL, which is seen as a problem by proponents of the yes view, yeah, by those who, are, who answer the question, yes, data is an object. And they argue that if we interpret the term object found in the 1977 treaty, if we interpret it in an evolutive way, it actually 
falls within the ordinary meaning. Data actually falls within the ordinary meaning of objects in 2020. So just ask any teenager if when you wipe out their Instagram account, whether they see that, whether they think that they have lost something of value, whether they, have, they think they have lost an object. So perhaps the notion of objects can also evolve over time. And then the proponents of the yes view also highlight that the notion of visibility and tangibility in the 70s, and then later on when it was used to comment on uh, the, the, the provision in the protocols, was meant to distinguish things that we can hold from goals and aims. So th that's what was meant when people said that things that are not visible or tangible are not to be seen as being within objects. But data, perhaps, it cannot be seen, but it certainly can be destroyed, and its destruction is certainly felt by those who are using the infrastructure as uh, not just problematic, but it can have destructive effects on our modern digitalized societies. Which also then brings me to the third point of those who say that data should be seen as an object, and that is the object and purpose. In other words, the teleology or the goal the, 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 that, that there is behind the provisions in question. And so, of course, we know that the additional protocol was uh, drafted in order to protect the victims of armed conflict and civilians are a big class of uh, victims of armed conflicts. And so if we have two interpretations, one of which is more protective to the civilians because their data held in a central registry office like the one where Bob works is protected. So if that's one interpretation and the other interpretation is that such uh, data would not be uh, protected. The proponents of the, the yes view say, well, it's the teleology, it's the object and purpose of the law that militates in favor of the extensive interpretation. So those of you who want to explore this further, there was a, a very interesting issue of the Israel Law Review in 2015, to which I had the chance to participate uh, together with uh, scholars, uh, including Heather Dinis and Mike Schmidt. And so we have described these views from an academic perspective, and you can explore it further there. But before I wrap up, let me just say a few words about what is the current ICRC position on this uh, question. And so the ICRC view is a bit of a compromise. It doesn't side with either of these two views, but, but we can probably say that it tends closer to the green uh, box on the previous slide, because what the ICRC's view is at the moment is that whether and to what extent civilian data constitute civilian objects is unresolved as a question of law, so that that's still unresolved. But to say that deleting or tampering with essential civilian data, such as the data that's held in the history office that we have just to say that that would not be prohibited would be difficult to reconcile again with the object and purpose of ihl and so and i find this very persuasive very convincing that the reporter files with digital files should not decrease the legal protection that is afforded by ihl in other words if we just take something that for now we have written on a piece of paper and stored in a file cabinet and now we transform it into data and until when it was in the paper cabinet, it was protected against being attacked. Now, suddenly, when it's stored in a server, it would not be protected. I find that quite, quite problematic. And so I don't have a problem uh, uh, agreeing now that I have taken my academic hat off and joined the ICRC. I don't find the problem uh, identifying with this sort of compromise solution. But we can discuss that uh, during the Q&A. So let me just wrap up so that we have some time for questions at the end. Uh, and so what have we seen today? We started with three big questions, and I said that they are big in different ways. The first one, does IHL apply to cyber operations? I propose that we answer it affirmative. To my mind, this is not a very difficult step, and the ICRC also has no doubt that that's the correct answer. IHL applies to cyber operations, and thus it constrains what states are permitted to do in times of armed conflict. And when we do that, we can move on to the second and the third level, which are the specific questions how IHL applies. And so we have asked the weapons question, and I propose that here the answer should be that military cyber capabilities should be subjected to legal review. And we have seen how that could operate in practice on, with the example of the malware that was targeted at this robotic maintenance equipment. And then the, the third question that we asked was the data question, with which we have actually just finished. And there I would propose that the answer is that well, whichever specific nuance of the legal interpretation you take, but I would propose that the answer should be that the object and purpose of IHL support affording protection to civilian data. So I'm going to end there. 
thank you very much for your attention. Heli, over to you. I look forward to hearing the questions that we might have received from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Kupam. And uh, I think um, each time I am listening to your lecture, I actually learn again. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it is really fascinating for non-lawyers how you explain so easily and understandably all these uh, difficult questions. Um, I think one of the questions that we have received is, um, is related with the current um, uh, ongoing um, international crisis. And, um, and there is a question whether the IHL would prohibit cyber operations against hospitals. So, thank you, Heli, and thank you for your kind words. It's always a pleasure to participate in uh, events that you run. Uh, if, if not for anything else, then because you always give me beautiful compliments, and so I always enjoy our exchanges. But to answer your question, does IHL prohibit operations against hospitals? The answer is absolutely yes. There are some questions that we have covered today which are controversial, and we can debate about the extent of the protection that IHL gives to specific types of data. But when it comes to protection of hospitals, there is no doubt. Uh, there is no doubt that IHL protects them against any disruption, and that is because we have specific rules in the Geneva Conventions, and then also uh, enshrined in customary international law. So for those uh, who uh, want to explore this further, the ICRC has produced a study on customary international humanitarian law and rules that are specific to the protection of hospitals are rules 25, 28 and 29 of the study. And so if we put it all together, the, the rules from the Geneva Convention, those that we see in uh, uh, customary international law, they require that medical units personnel and transport must be protected by the parties to an armed conflict, must be respected and protected by the parties to armed conflicts at all times. And so what does that mean, that they must be respected and protected? That entails two separate obligations. One is a negative obligation, which is very easy, that simply do not make these installations, these facilities, the subject of attack. And secondly, there is the positive obligation, which is which entails actually protecting them. So all feasible measures that are uh, available to states, to, to armed conflicts, to protect such facilities, such medical facilities from, uh, from interference. And so the only remaining step then is whether that protection, which is clear, it's black letter law, also extends to cyber operations. And so that takes us to the threshold question. So if we accept that IHL also limits cyber operations, which we have discussed, and I think that's the correct answer, then surely it also limits in the sense it prohibits cyber operations against hospitals. And as you rightly say, this is particularly important in against the backdrop of the current crisis. And it is also something that at the ICRC we have been saying for quite some time, so even before the, the current pandemic, we have looked at what are the potential human costs of cyber operations. And we have a longer report that we issued in May last year, and that identified a particular vulnerability of the healthcare sector. So we already saw that there might be a problem there. And of course, as the, the current pandemic uh, began, we have seen cyber attacks against hospitals, which are particularly concerning. But when it comes to situations of armed conflict, there is no doubt that such facilities are protected from cyber attacks. Um, thank you. And the second question would be uh, related to uh, the core uh, subjects of IHL. Um, there is a question how and uh, when exactly the cyber operation can also constitute armed conflict. Uh, we see the belligerent behavior from states and reprisals in cyberspace. Uh, and at what point such activities can be considered armed conflict? So that's an excellent question, Heli, and uh, it's uh, one of those, the edges of which are controversial, but the core uh, we have an answer for already. So in other words, uh, 
we need to start answering it by looking at the types of conflict that we have in uh, international humanitarian law. There are two main types of conflict, international armed conflicts that are in essence conflicts between states and non-international armed conflicts that are in essence conflicts within one state, so usually between a state and, a, and an organized armed group or sometimes between several of such organized armed groups. So I see that we're running out of time, so let's, let me just answer the question, can a cyber operation start an international national armed conflict, where the intensity is particularly low. We know on the authority of the Tadic case of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that an armed conflict, an international armed conflict takes place whenever there is a resort to armed force between states. And so I say that this question, the core of it is clear, because if a cyber operation produced effects that would be equivalent with a kinetic strike, so let's take an example of a cyber operation against the air traffic control uh, in another state, or a cyber operation that would open the floodgates of a dam and thus causing significant loss of life and uh, material destruction on the territory of another state, there is very little doubt that states would agree that this is to uh, an international armed conflict. And of course, luckily, no such incident has happened thus far. But where the edges of that question, as I have said, are a bit more controversial, is what happens when there are when the effects are not equivalent to such kinetic attacks. So, for example, when there is a cyber operation that disables the functionality of a power grid in the territory of another state, or that brings down the stock exchange. So the losses may also be extensive, but we don't see uh, specific effect in the physical world. And so on that, the law remains uncertain. And basically, you know, you said in the beginning, in your opening speech, that it's very important for states to come forward and to express their views on how international law applies. So this is one of the questions on which we need to hear more from states before we can say, okay, the law has settled in a certain way. Thank you, Kubo. And yes, uh, your uh, lecture confirms once again that um, the state practice and state uh, statements on artic and articulations on how a law applies are now uh, crucial for all of us. Thank you so much again. And, and this, your lecture now concludes the international security uh, part of our uh, virtual masterclass. And now we are going to discuss uh, capacity building issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heli. Thank you. Uh, our next lecturer will be Mr. Christopher Painter. Hi, Chris. Christopher hey. Painter has been um, on the forefront of cyber policy for nearly 30 years. Serving as a US federal prosecutor, um, trying high profile cybercrime cases, and also as a senior official in the US Department of Justice, FBI, and the White House. He was the first cyber diplomat uh, in the United States and also in the world uh, assigned to the uh, cyber coordinator position in the US State Department in 2011. Um, until 2017, he uh, was the US first cyber coordinator. Among other things, uh, Chris now serves as the president of the Global Forum of Cyber Expertise Foundation is on the board of the Center for Internet Security and is also an associate fellow at uh, Chatham House. And Chris will talk about the Global Forum of Cybersecurity and the state of uh, cyber capacity building. Please, Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Heli, and thank you for both having this session today, or all these sessions today, and, and your support of these issues over a number of years. Uh, you know, first, I, I'd say that although we're moving to the capacity building section, of this discussion, it is not totally divorced in any way from the discussion we just heard on secure international security, um, particularly the issues of norms and confidence building measures, because uh, one part of cyber capacity building deals with precisely those issues, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, as as Helly mentioned, um, you know, I, I had the, the honor of being the first really dedicated cyber diplomat and really establishing the first office uh, in a foreign ministry that was really dedicated to these issues, not just cybersecurity issues, but the full sweep of cyber issues, as Heli said in the opening, that included things like human rights online, uh, internet governance, 
other security issues, cybercrime, the, the whole basket of issues because there was interdependencies between these. Uh, and when I established that new office, uh, capacity building was part of the mandate of that office from the beginning, and that's very important. And you may ask yourself, why? Why, why is capacity building so important as part of this larger issue uh, or larger basket of issues of uh, cyber policy, uh, cyber security, uh, even cyber diplomacy? And the reason is, as, as all of you on this call know, uh, or this video conference know, cyberspace is global. Uh, the threats are global. The policy is global. And, and because of this, uh, these issues really cannot be just the province of a few states, as is the case in some other areas of international security, uh, or really, for that matter, the province of just a few stakeholders. It is a, a broad discussion that really involves every country in the world uh, at various levels, and, and really the stakeholders across the gamut, from civil society uh, to industry to academia. So, so let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, cyber threats. Uh, Heli said in her opening that uh, you don't want any country to be the weakest link, and that's certainly true you know, with cyber threats. Before uh, I went and became a diplomat, I was a prosecutor doing cybercrime cases, and uh, if you're a smart uh, cyber criminal, you will route your attacks through different countries because it makes it harder uh, for the authorities to find you, to trace you, and to bring you to justice. Uh, if you're a nation state, you see these attacks happen uh, through many different countries or affecting many countries at once. And so they're by their nature global. And if you're going to respond to those, and if you're going to either protect against them or respond to them, you need to have a more global approach. Uh, the other aspect of this that I think is important is that every country is in a position to help every other country. So uh, it may seem to say the US that it shouldn't matter if, um, if a country uh, has the uh, ability, has a national cert, for instance, a computer emergency response team, if they have the ability uh, to respond to an incident domestically, why should that matter to the US? Well, it does matter to the US because if those attacks are routed through those countries or in, even originate in those countries, uh, that country can help the US mitigate the uh, attacks on itself. And that's true for every country around the world. We are interlinked in cyberspace in a way we just aren't in other areas. Uh, cyber policy is the same way. Uh, we've talked a lot in the beginning of this series of lectures about a lot of the debates that are happening in the UN at the Open-Ended Working Group, at the GGE, uh, and at various regional organizations around the world. I, I used to joke that, uh, you know, there are so many cyber summits, it's like the Cyber Alps. There are so many different things happening, both intergovernmental discussions and broader discussions with other stakeholders, uh, that you really need to be involved in these discussions because what happens is decisions that are made in these forums, which may be, you know, hundreds or thousands of miles away, will affect your domestic policy, your domestic preparedness, and your domestic ability to both respond to threats and to engage in these discussions. And I thought, think it's also critically important that every state, as I said earlier, gets involved in these discussions and be able to, to mitigate these threats. So, so really every country and every stakeholder is important in this. It's just not the province of a few. It's not just the province of the big countries, the developed countries, or even the countries that have a lot of cyber experience every country needs to be involved in this. And I think what we find is that, and the reason this was a core pillar of my office when I started it was cyber, uh, cyber security and cyber capacity building is really foundational to all the other pillars we talk about, to the international security pillars, to the internet governance pillars, to the human rights pillars. And we need to make sure that we're, we're advancing that. Now, I mentioned that uh, this was a priority for my office when it started. And indeed, I think it's a priority for many of these diplomatic offices that have been started around the world, uh, and rightly so. Uh, one of the things we did early on was we did a, uh, a regional training, because that was most effective in terms of resources, on various policy issues in the East African commuting, uh, community, for the East African community uh, in Nairobi. And this was like right after my office was created uh, way back now, <laughs> 2011. Uh, and uh, that was very effective because we not just talked about cybersecurity in that aspect, we also brought into, uh, uh, into the mix uh, how this would affect human rights online, uh, what the cybercrime aspects are. We made it a more holistic approach. And so that was one of the things 
we led with, but we did many more of those. And many other countries did this too. And, and it's not surprising that I think Kelly mentioned this in the beginning too, that as we go to these international forums, and I mentioned that everyone is talking about cyber issues to some extent, um, that cyber capacity building has been one of the prime topics of equation. In some sense, people think it's maybe the low hanging fruit. In other sense, I think it's something that people tangibly understand. So when you have the open-ended working group meetings in the UN, uh, and I've been to several of those sessions, capacity building features prominently in those discussions. Almost every country raises that issue, uh, not just uh, developed countries, but many, many developing countries uh, who are now seized with understanding that cyber is a priority issue and, and focused on this issue. And, and indeed, I think the COVID-19 crisis that we've seen has highlighted why this is such an issue around the world. Uh, even countries that are less developed and don't have as developed of a digital infrastructure are understanding the dependencies on those infrastructures. And if you're supposed to, if you're trying to promote your social and economic growth and have that connectivity, which everyone's more and more dependent on in this, in this interconnected world, you need to have good cybersecurity as an underlying aspect. And so that's certainly raised the issue and it's raised the issue in these UN meetings as well. Um, we also, uh, uh, see this happening in diplomatic circles. I mentioned that my office was the first, but certainly not the only. When we started in 2011, we may have been the first, but now there are over 40 countries who in their foreign ministries have dedicated cyber offices, including obviously uh, Estonia, who's hosting this, who's been uh, a real uh, mover and shaker in this area. Um, so what that means is that I think countries are now at a diplomatic level, understanding that cyber security is more important and that means that it's more of a policy issue, which means there has to be more attention on how this is done. And part of that is building the internal capacity of countries to deal with this. And I'll raise that a moment in a moment uh, uh, in more depth in a moment as well. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention, sort of as a, a general remark, is that, um, and Helly mentioned this in the beginning as well, but I really want to emphasize this is that for too long, I think people have thought of cyber capacity building or really even cybersecurity as being a boutique issue, as a issue just for the folks who are uh, uh, seized with these issues to understand. And that's, that's not true. This is a, uh, this needs to be a mainstream issue. This needs to be an issue that is the focus of every country uh, and dealing with it. Um, so, so as I look at these issues, uh, it, is, it is incredibly important for us to, uh, uh, to seize on these issues, to make sure they're important um, and not treat this as an outlier, but a part of our basic economic and social growth. There are three types of capacity building I wanna discuss. Uh, one uh, is the uh, internal, uh, I'll call it internal capacity building. Uh, and by internal, I mean um, with respect to uh, our diplomatic uh, approach to this. Now, I mentioned creating the cyber office at the State Department, and uh, that was really important. But, uh, the, um, but one of the things I found in doing that was that as a new area, it was an area that people just didn't understand, that they just didn't deal with uh, that they hadn't dealt with before. And so it was really important to, um, uh, it was really important for us to mainstream that issue within the State Department. So for all the people on the call who are dealing with this issue uh, and are dealing with how we can create this as a foreign policy issue, one of the things you have a challenge of is actually doing that internal capacity building, mainstreaming the issue with your own foreign ministry and within your own government. Uh, and that's, that's something that's often difficult, but it's, a, it's a, something I think we can look to each other to help build. The second area is diplomacy and policy. I mentioned that uh, in this area, uh, that uh, this is something where um, there are uh, there are aspects of policy that are being debated around the world. Uh, and that includes norms and CBMs. And I think that's a critically important part of uh, the discussion as we look at this. 
And the norms and CBMs issue, which was discussed in full uh, earlier on, uh, is various issues, um, we need to focus on that aspect as one of those particular uh, important issues. So, uh, you know, for instance, one of the products that was produced by the GFC, which I'll discuss in much more length in a few moments, uh, was a overview of current CBMs and how they apply in cyberspace, which could be a good primer for various people. So, so we have the internal, we have the diplomatic and policy, we have structural, which is and strategic, which are things like national strategies, making sure that countries have strong national strategies to deal with uh, uh, cyber security. Uh, I find national strategies are the foundational element of cyber security, that they're the key part of a country when they deal with it. If you think about uh, when any country is first approaching these issues, it's important to think about what your overall strategy is. A strategy raises the political level in a country, makes it more of a priority, but also really uh, does a couple of different things. One, it, it harnesses different stakeholders from across the spectrum, including governments, the private sector, academia, et cetera. Uh, two, it, uh, it, it allows um, uh, a structure to be put forth, a plan for that government to move it forward. And increasingly, all of these national strategies have international aspects, international chapters, which are really crit critically important. Uh, the other kind of structural things we're talking about is building certs, building the computer emergency response teams. Those are an important aspect of this, or dealing with cybercrime and cybercrime legislation, including things like the Budapest Convention. So that's a category, uh, the third category of capacity building. The fourth is really technical and skills. And again, this is something that Heli mentioned in, the, uh, in her opening, uh, things like uh, how we actually uh, promote better uh, information sharing, how we promote cooperation between uh, the, uh, the various aspects of our, 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 our government within our countries, but also with other governments on issues like cybercrime, on threat reduction, on uh, information sharing with respect to indicators and response. Um, and, and this also includes skills and education. How do we raise awareness of our population? How do we make sure that skills are, are taught across the board? So there's a wide a variety of different kinds of capacity building that I think are becoming more important to every country around the world. This is not an area where there's been a, a paucity of activity. There's been a lots of work going on that I want to mention some of it before turning to the GFC. Uh, there's been lots of work by almost every developed country and even developing country in this area. Uh, the Netherlands has been very active, the US, the UK, Australia, Estonia, the EU, uh, many others. And that's really, I think, important for more countries to, to make this a priority for their, their programming, for their, uh, their capacity building programming. Um, and, you know, as Heli mentioned, you know, making this not just this outlier goal, cybersecurity, but also part of the larger development agenda is critically important. This is not just cybersecurity. This is underlying our economic and social growth. So when we think about the UN development goals, this needs to be part of that larger goal. And I think that increases the aperture for even more capacity building around the world and for this not to be squirreled away as, a, as some little corner, but something that's key uh, to, to our, our continued success uh, in meeting those development goals uh, for the future for all countries. Uh, there's been lots of work by regional organizations. The Organization for American States, for instance, has done a lot of work uh, in their region on capacity building with respect to national strategies and building computer emergency response teams. ASEAN has did good work, including trying to start thinking about how we take the CBMs and norms forward. Uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe has been particularly focused on capacity building with respect to uh, uh, confidence building measures, and I think that's been important. Heli mentioned the EU, and we're going to have more of a presentation on that in a few minutes, and that's been important. The African Union has been focusing on these issues too. 
uh, as well as a number of regional organizations within Africa. So all of that is critically important, and it's great to see all this different activity, although I'd submit there still needs to be more activity and more focus on this and making this, again, more than just a cyber issue. But one of the challenges that I think that many of us have seen as we've looked at this issue is coordination. Um, uh, you know, I used to joke uh, when I was in government that sometimes the same three people in the country were trained by five different countries and four different international entities in successive weeks. And we don't have a lot of resources to devote this area. So we need to really structure our capacity building. So we're doing it in the most efficient, most coordinated way possible. And for that reason, uh, the, uh, the GFCE was... Um, uh, was first set up, and uh, that was it was set up in uh, 2011 by the Dutch government. Uh, the GFC is the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise. It is an organization of 115 members, including governments, international organizations, uh, NGOs, non non governmental organizations, civil society, technical and academia, so really across the board of all stakeholders. And it has over 60 countries involved, but all these other stakeholders as well. And it was set up by the Netherlands uh, after they had a big global conference on cyberspace back in 2015 to answer this issue of how do we better coordinate? How do we better make effective worldwide capacity building? Because this is such a key and foundational issue. I, I should mention just for folks on, the, on this uh, session, you can find more information about the GG, uh, GFC at www.thegfce.org, which has more information and more is being added all the time, and, and you're welcome to look at that. But this was a critical organization that's grown significantly since it was formed in 2015. And as you see from the slide, and I'm not going to delve in detail on all the information on the slide because I do want to leave some time for questions as we go through, but the basic mission is to fully reap the benefits of, of uh, ICT through a free, open, peaceful, and secure digital world. So more than just cybersecurity, we need to look at those other aspects, including uh, human rights online, et cetera. And to strengthen cyber capacity and expertise globally uh, by being pragmatic, action-oriented, and a flexible platform for collaboration. That's really what the GFC is. It's a platform to bring all these stakeholders together to really make our capacity building more effective and coordinated. So as, as we look at the pillars, the main pillars of activity, the key things are one, to help coordinate projects. Uh, so that's bringing together uh, different parts of the community, uh, uh, you know, through regional meetings, through global meetings, increasingly through online meetings, as we're doing, we're all doing these days, uh, to get better coordination and information sharing with respect to them. The second key pillar is to help share knowledge and expertise. And, you know, this helps us you know, both understand what's out there and not reinvent the wheel because there's so much activity that it's hard to keep track of. So one of the things that the GFC recently did in our, um, our last in-person meeting, which was in Africa at the African Union in Addis Ababa, is launch something called the Sybil Portal. And this is a knowledge portal, uh, which is accessible which uh, it comprises a portal that has all this different information from all over the world in terms of best practices, in terms of other documents, in terms of strategies, uh, some, a place where people can go to find what they need, to find the information they're looking for, so they don't have to go to multiple places. And even in the few months now, I guess it's been uh, several months since we had our meeting in December when this was launched, uh, there's been significant growth in that portal. I, I recommend people check that out and help contribute to it. It's been really an important aspect of our work. One of the key aspects, though, of the GFC's work is uh, what we call the clearinghouse function, the matchmaker function. Uh, often countries don't know where to turn when they need help. Uh, where do they go when they need help with a national strategy? Where do they go when they need help uh, with uh, building a cert or with skills or with awareness raising? It's not really clear. Uh, so what we've done is we've set up this way for countries to come and ask the GFC for assistance. And when they do that, uh, there is a process that's begun that involves the other stakeholders in the GFC. So an example of this was Sierra Leone, who came to the GFC asking for help on a national strategy. 
Uh, again, that's the foundational one, the foundational building blocks of, of uh, cyber capacity and really cyber security in the country overall. And through a process where there was discussion with Sierra Leone about what they needed, what they wanted, what their uh, processes were, how their government uh, was engaged in this, uh, we assembled a group of different stakeholders from throughout the community, uh, people who could do the general assessment of what this country actually needed and then help execute the capacity building that we require to be required to do the national strategy and even how to follow up on that strategy. I mean, one of the things I think has been lacking in this area is having good ways of measuring success over time. Um, and so that's just one example. We've gotten many more requests from countries and we're trying to make that matchmaking happen, bringing the right stakeholders together uh, with the right resources. And that's a critical part of, of our efforts that needs to continue. And then the last effort I think is also important was to fill knowledge gaps. One of the things we've done is have all of our stakeholders look at the field that's out there, see what is missing. What is it that hasn't been produced? You know, sometimes there's multiple uh, products that we can put together and we put on the portal, but often there are areas where there's not really been uh, work and there's not been a focused attention on. So what are those gaps? And then how can we help fill that gap? And so. Another thing that the GFC launched recently was a global research agenda. And this is doing exactly that, identifying what those gaps are, finding out how we can fill them, how we can get folks to actually do the work to fill those gaps. So, so the, all those have been very important. Okay, just going to my next slide. Um, the work of the GFC is done, as I said, by the stakeholders. It is a bottom-up, uh, member-driven organization. Uh, and there's a very, uh, it, and there's an excellent secretariat that helps work all of this, helps make sure that all of these, uh, these groups are talking together and, how, and, and that the GFC is moving forward. But a lot of the work is done in these working groups. Uh, and, this, uh, and these are the working groups. And again, I'll hit these at a high level, uh, but leave you the slides so that you can delve into them in more depth. The first one uh, is on cybersecurity policy and strategy. And as I said, those national strategies are often foundational to how we deal with cybersecurity so, and how a country does. So that's a key part. Uh, but it also includes, very importantly, not just those national strategies and assessments, but CBMs, norms, cyber diplomacy, international law and cyberspace, all the things we talked about in the first half of this lecture, they're all part of this capacity building effort because every country needs to be in the game on those. Every country needs to be discussing those issues. Every country needs to know how to create and run and implement a cyber diplomacy program. Um, you know, this I should I should be clear that we are not trying to duplicate the forums in the UN. We're not trying to negotiate new norms and new CBMs. We're trying to take what's come out of those groups and make sure countries know about them and can implement them and work on them. And so that's been a key aspect recently, not just the strategies, but also those norms. And I mentioned the product on CBMs that I recommend to folks. Uh, the second working group is cyber incident management and critical infrastructure protection. And this has a couple aspects. One you know, creating those national cyber incident security response teams. Uh, how do you deal with the analytics? How do you deal with cyber exercises and, and carrying them out? How do you deal with critical information uh, structure protection, which is not just governments, but other stakeholders as well. So that's been a critical one. The third one deals with cyber crime. And that's both on the high level, you know, what laws do we need? Like the Budapest Convention, uh, which is uh, the global, the only convention really that deals with cybercrime out there has been very effective in garnering more signatures, and that's important. But also, you know, how do you deal with cybercrime training and, uh, and, and uh, the more tactical aspects of cooperation between various elements? And so that's been one working group. Uh, the fourth one is cybersecurity, culture, and skills. That's awareness, education and training, workforce development, all key aspects. And finally, one on cybersecurity standards. So all of those have been the real driving forces to identify the gaps, making sure we're identifying the needs. If a country comes to this matchmaking function of C and asks, for instance, for a cybersecurity policy or strategy, we can then make sure that we cross-reference all these other groups and say, well, maybe they also need to assert, maybe they also need to deal with some cybercrime, that we can be as much as possible that one-stop shop that then directs them the resources they need 
which as I said, and very, I'm very happy about this. Many more countries are prioritizing and spending resources and doing this. And as Heli also said, the World Bank is turning to this with a uh, cybersecurity fund, which I think will be critically important. Uh, so, so those working groups, I think, have been very effective. We've done a lot of work in uh, in promoting those different issues, of following up on those different issues. Uh, you know, the the working groups are created now just a couple of years ago, but they have uh, really grown in terms of membership uh, and and devotion to the people involved in creating various products. They're now on the portal. All of those things have been very helpful. Uh, we had we just had our our uh, meeting, which was, like many of you, not a in-person meeting, but a virtual meeting over seven weeks of our members in 35 different sessions uh, to have people contribute and talk about these issues. And as I say, as these become more of a political imperative, and we hear this more in the UN and other forums, we need to be ready to answer this call and make sure that we're doing these different issues. So I want to then just go to my last slide, which is, you know, this is, you know, so cyber capacity building is critically important. It is a part of the ecosystem. It is an underlying uh, uh, foundational aspect of how we can actually make progress in all these different areas, including combating threats, including making sure we're having, uh, you know, good policy going forward and making sure that we have the right people at the various debates on these issues. Um, and the challenge to do this is to create an interlinked and coordinated global network for cyber capacity building. So we don't have this fragmentation. We don't have lots of people doing things without realizing what other people are doing, what resources are there, or how they can coordinate. So, you know, that's the overall challenge. And it's a big challenge, frankly, but it's one that I think we're, we're up to meeting. You know, uh, I've been... Uh, the fact that the, the organization, the GFC, has grown substantially over the last number of years has been important. The fact that I mentioned the Dutch created this organization, the government of the Netherlands created this organization, but uh, in the last year they've spun this organization off to an independent foundation, which I'm uh, very pleased to be the president of the foundation board. Uh, but that's really important because now it has independence, so we could draw more resources and more uh, more members, and I think that's important. And we need to make sure that we're serving the needs of the community, the country community and the other stakeholder community. So that going forward would be critically important too, as part of this larger effort to support capacity building. So as we look at, at the challenges that I think are subsumed in that, uh, one is to really enlarge the pool of international resources. And, and part of that goes back to what I said earlier. This can't be seen as this technical issue this must be seen as a larger political issue and part of a larger uh, development agenda so that we're not pigeonholing these issues and the resources devoted to them can be commensurate with what the, really, real, what the real needs are. Uh, we want to be able to implement the relevant outcomes of the UNGG and the OEWG. Again, that's a link to the earlier part of this discussion. I expect there'll be recommendations and discussion of capacity building there certainly has been already in the OEWG. I expect that will be in the GG as well. That has happened in prior years, but be able to take that and make sure that we're, we're meeting those needs. Um, we want to also, in recognition of what's going on these days, uh, develop and execute a more uh, robust online training program uh, for cyber capacity building. Now, it will never take the place of in-person meetings and training, but I think it's critically important. And then finally, really strengthen this international coordination that is the, uh, uh, the sine qua non, the, uh, the whole reason for the GFC to exist. Um, with re and we wanna do that with regional organizations and around the world. So uh, even, you know, you have to make sure you're inclusive and then that's inclusive globally. That means to make sure that countries, whether they be in uh, the Asia Pacific region or in, in, in the America's hemisphere where I am, that all of them are included and that we're making sure we're dealing with all of them and meeting their needs, but also making sure we're including their expertise and resources. So that's something that needs to be important. Uh, and we're, we're moving forward. And, you know, additionally, we need to make sure we continue to work on the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the global research agenda. That's just beginning. That's something that uh, folks on the call might want to get involved in. I think it's critically important. Uh, and then and the portal to further develop that. So all of those are areas where we want to make sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of the community, but really being on the leading edge of this. And as I said, it's a critically important area. Uh, we welcome 
uh, more countries and organizations to participate. Uh, this is, I think, one of the things that's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, we're not going to solve this overnight, but it's going to be part and parcel of everything else you've heard here today. Uh, so with that, Heli, I will uh, I will stop and I'll leave some time for questions. Thank you so much, Chris, for um, uh, explaining us what the GFC is doing and what are the challenges for the global capacity building. And I totally agree. We have to really join our forces and um, make sure that um, we coordinate and um, also may, um, reach um, the um, recipients uh, uh, with the right um, package that we can help them, actually. So uh, we have received uh, several questions for capacity building uh, lecture, and um, I'll ask uh, the first one. Uh, first question is why capacity building is important for cyber diplomacy? So I think when often when people think of diplomacy, they think, oh, we're just going to go and negotiate things, right? That's what diplomats do. They negotiate things. Uh, they go to international meetings. And that's indeed part of cyber diplomacy. It's a core component of it. But uh, you know, capacity building, as I said, really is uh, you know, is critical in several ways. One, it allows you to have this collective response against shared threat. So for instance, I think Jim Lewis mentioned this, uh, one of the aspects is how do you respond to these threats we're seeing every day? And it's more, I think, impactful and actually more effective if countries can do it collectively, if they can band together to do this. I saw this when, when I was a cyber diplomat, when we saw some, some uh, activity and we can get other countries to work on this, whether it's for attribution or whether it's for response. But to do that, you actually have to get countries to understand why this is important, to get them involved in discussions of these issues, but also have the capability to, to assist, you know, to have the actual uh, certain other capability. So one of the reasons capacity building from a selfish perspective for countries is important is because it helps them. It helps everyone around the world because you can act collectively. But it's also important for these countries to have, um, to have the capacity to make sure they can deal with these threats domestically. So it, it helps, I think, the entire world community, since we're so interlinked, for these countries to have that. Uh, and that needs to be something the diplomats are pushing. And if they don't push it, it becomes kind of a fragmented issue. Your law enforcement agencies may be doing some capacity building internationally. Maybe your, your technical agencies are doing some, or they're members of different groups. And, you know, just like in other areas, histor historically, a lot of these different silos don't talk to each other. And diplomats can bring them together and they, again, elevate this from this technical issue to one of a policy issue and a core national security issue and, and economic security issue that's part of a country's larger agenda that will help us, I think, respond to these threats and also seize the challenges, make sure that we're making cyberspace safe for all the things that we want to do that are good on cyberspace. Uh, cybersecurity is not an end in itself. It is, a, uh, it is a road to help us achieve all the good things we want to achieve globally. Yes, I agree. <laughs> um, second question is about the uh, coordination of the capacity building. What kind of clearinghouse uh, would be required for more efficient coordination of cyber capacity building efforts? Yeah, so that, that's exactly, as I mentioned, that was the core, one of the core uh, principles of the GFC is to provide that clearinghouse function. Um, you know, I, I short, short, I short named that the matchmaker function, you know, to get, uh, to make sure that we're identifying what the needs are. Uh, and we really rely on countries to come forward and ask for help, but we wanna also make sure we're aware of countries that need help. And then to put together essentially the consortium of different resources, of different countries, of different not NGOs, of companies who can help them meet that challenge. And it's up to them ultimately, nothing gets forced on the country. A country can ask, we need help, we present to them the kind of menu of options. We bring together the various stakeholders and they can work with the stakeholders and make sure it's carried forward. So, you know, it is, um, it is a way of, of doing this matchmaking uh, in a way that's most effective for the countries, but also brings more stakeholders together. So for that to work though, you need to have a good array of stakeholders who can provide those resources and you need to have a good array of resources in place. So. You know, our, as I said, our members include many nation states, both on the receiving end of capacity building, but also on the donor end. Uh, we have international organizations, including uh, some of the UN international organizations, but many others. We have regional organizations, as I mentioned, like OAS and others. Uh, so we have a pretty, we have companies, we have, um, um, you know, civil society groups. We have a pretty broad breadth of people who can help with this in various ways. 
and then trying to put that together and keep track of it over time. So that's exactly what we're, we're putting together. We've used it a number of times now. We need to build and do that more. We need to scale it up. Uh, but that's something that I think is really needed. And then we have a question about the private sector role. Um, how uh, should we further develop public-private partnership for uh, cyber capacity building? And what is the role of the private sector in the GFC initiatives? Yeah, the private sector has been a key component in a lot of our initiatives. And so, you know, uh, some of it are in individual projects that, that, are help, that are helped coordinated by the GFC, like doing threat assessments for particular parts of the world. We've had those done. Uh, we have a number of private sector entities. I want more. I think we have about 20 now, but I'd like many more from around the world to be part of uh, the organization. Um, you know, uh, Microsoft, Symantec, uh, Palo Alto Networks, many of these country, companies have been very helpful in different aspects, you know, on some on the norms and CBMs aspects, some on the CERT building aspects, some on the uh, infrastructure protection aspects, some on the skills aspects. Uh, that's been an important area, for instance. Uh, because some of these companies have already been doing some of this work. And, and uh, you know, I think this is a theme of this presentation really throughout the day, Heli. You know, we can't make this just a government issue. Uh, this has to have other stakeholders involved. And capacity building, I think, is really doubles down on that because countries are increasingly having budgets to do this. That's important. Other stakeholders have important perspectives. You know, as countries are developing their economic capabilities in this area, you know, for instance, I mentioned this Nairobi training I did, we did back in 2011, that was for the East African community. They just got into major cable drops, so they're getting more internet access. They were dealing with online payment systems like M-Pesa. So they really wanted help in terms of de developing their strategy and their policies. And we had private sector players involved in that too. So, so I, I, you know, we can't, we can't stovepipe this. We need private sector. We also need academia and civil society. Having that mix is I think incredibly powerful. And I haven't seen that in really any other forum where we bring together all these different organizations for the purposes of capacity building. And, and I think it's been made richer. Now, that said, I want to increase the membership of all those different groups, including um, including uh, the private sector participation. So if you're a company or a private sector entity that's interested, let us know. Thank you so much, Chris, for all of your efforts uh, as a cyber diplomat and now as a global leader for uh, cyber capacity building. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you again for having me here today and uh, I'm putting on this excellent group of uh, sessions. So I uh, hope to continue to work with you. Thank you. And as we progress with our um, virtual masterclass, I'm very glad now uh, that um, uh, I have other colleagues speaking from the studio here in Tallinn. And I'm glad to introduce uh, Mr. Seem Aladalu, who is here. Uh, and um, Seem is currently uh, the um, expert at the Estonian Information System Authority and uh, has been in charge of the EU cyber capacity building network since August 2019. Prior to joining the Estonian Information System Authority, Seem uh, worked for five years at the NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence as the head of international relations, where he organized also the Locked Shields Technical Cyber Defense Exercise and the SICON Conference, among uh, other tasks. Between 2001 and 2014, Seem uh, was working for the Estonian Ministry of Defense in various NATO-related positions. In 2008 uh, to 2011, he served as a diplomat at the Estonian delegation to NATO in Brussels. Simaladalo is a graduate of the Maxwell School of Syracuse University uh, in international relations uh, as a Fulbright Fellow and as he has studied also at the Baltic Defence College. He is currently enrolled in the PhD program at the Tallinn University for Technology. So the floor is yours, Sim. Well, uh, thank you very much, Heli, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. It's indeed an honor to address this masterclass. I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one impressed by what we've learned today from this excellent line of speakers. Uh, well, as we've learned today, the past dozen, even more years, uh, 
we have seen an incredible increase in the global connectivity offered by the internet and uh, it has provided real-time interaction, interaction between our societies, inside the societies, uh, in all areas, almost everywhere. And that has actually encouraged countries to also look into their, uh, the issue of uh, national cybersecurity capacity. And, uh, well, obviously today, cyber capacity, it's not just about the technology, the bits and bytes, but it's a cross-cutting, cross multifaceted issue of policy, education and training, just to name a few. Well, looking at the title of my presentation, it would thus be put into ask, so EU, cyber capacity, a network. Uh, what do they mean? Uh, what are they good for? And why does it matter for the EU and indeed the other countries outside the EU. Well, as, as you, Ambassador, uh, mentioned in your opening speech, uh, the different walks related to cyber diplomacy, the masterclass which we are uh, at attending today, uh, issues such as norms, uh, confidence building measures, international law, etc., et they, they are all underpinned by cyber capacity. The uh, EU Cyber Capacity Building Network, or EU CyberNet, as we call it, is a new initiative by the European Union, implemented in partnership uh, of the Estonian Information System Authority, RIA, and the European Commission Director General for Development and Cooperation, with support from our international consortium partners. Before explaining the network, I would take a minute to discuss the broader context. On one hand, EU cyber capacity building as such is a natural outcome of a gradual process of negotiations and agreements. While being a historian originally myself, uh, in this particular storyline we don't need to go too, too, too far back in history. Uh, you see a number of documents listed here, uh, or agreements between the European Union's different decision-making bodies, the Council, the Commission, the Parliament, during just the past seven years. The list is not exhaustive, it doesn't include all the agreements on cybersecurity or development cooperation or digitalization. What the, the story of the site is, what it represents, however, is that all these issues, they have evolved to become one of the priorities of the Union. Most recently, for instance, the 2020 EU digital package make this, makes this very clear, establishing a clear way forward for the EU in the coming years. On the other hand, one of the reasons why capacity building matters for literally any country around the world is the unprecedented increase in global connectivity, as mentioned. The global number of people grows, that's a fact, but what we see is that the number online grows even faster. I will not go into the number of devices online, which is growing even more fast. Suffice to say that uh, every second person and more on Earth is online. Couple that with the increasing number of state services that are provided online, and you can see the growing potential for increased access to public digital services and financial inclusion. Lastly, it comes down to the growth of economies, welfare for the people, essentially making cyber capacity relevant and required on all levels. As already discussed by Chris Painter, there's a lot happening in this realm. Indeed, the EU does not uh, act alone in cyber capacity building. However, as a values-based union, the EU adheres to a number of principles to guide these activities. The EU has launched a number of projects that deal with cyber issues, such as, for instance, the Glassy Plus or Cyber for Development, to name just a few that focus specifically on developing areas such as cybersecurity policies, institutional setups, fight against cybercrime, public diplomacy in countries outside the EU. However, with the constant development of technology and the need for new skills, no country or organization can ever be cyber ready. There are a number of often repeating challenges that you see listed here. Note that's not a order of priority or frequency or severity. But I guess the bottom line lesson to take is that absorption, capacity, or the very essential challenge of digitalization efforts that go, don't go hand in hand with cybersecurity considerations 
are challenges that are shared quite widely around the world. So what then is the EU Cybernet? EU Cybernet has two purposes. It aims to strengthen the delivery coordination and coherence of EU's efforts in cyber capacity building, as well as in reinforce EU's capacity to perform that function. In short, to bring the Union's expertise together. One might ask, so you already have those great projects. Why one more? What is the difference and what is the added value? The added value of EU Cybernet comes by way of reaching out to the actual pool of actual uh, experts, presenting them with the most up-to-date, good to challenges to have and that the world can offer, and thereby strengthening the Union as well as the partner countries. Here are the four deliverables uh, of the EU Cybernet we're currently working on. EU Cybernet will include at least 500 cybersecurity experts representing the different areas that are all cyber, from technology to cyber law, from cyber strategy to responding to incidents. Alongside, we will reach out to institutions to establish a stakeholder community. Secondly, we will um, offer training and assistance uh, capability in coordination with the other EU cyber capacity projects which are already out there. Thirdly, EU Cybernet would become a knowledge hub for the EU institutions and bodies. And lastly, but not less important, of course, perhaps even most visible to everyone will be the uh, online technical platform, especially in our modern online times. Will it be relevant to me and my country, you might, you might ask? Uh, well, EU Cybernet, you see on the map, we don't have any geographic limitations. You see on the map uh, are the uh, uh, delegations of the EU around the world. So we strive to work, of course, together to achieve the best uh, in cooperation with the existing EU uh, delegations as well as projects. Uh, and of course, we will make sure that uh, we adhere to the cyber capacity building principles that we highlighted before. The stakeholder community is already in the making. On one hand, we will reach out to the expert community EU-wide as soon as possible. Uh, but on the other, we will be keen to learn how EU Cybernet can best support you in developing your cyber capacity outside the EU. So before we come to you, and I will conclude this brief, here are a few key takeaways. Let's be frank to ourselves. Achieving cybersecurity capacity is a moving target. And no party can ever be 100% cyber ready today, nor for good. Cyber can and does mean different things, and recognizing this is essential in improving your national or institutional or even personal resilience. Development will continue to require digitalization, and digitalization needs to go hand in hand with cybersecurity considerations. The EU will remain the biggest development cooperation provider and the share of cybersecurity related activities will grow further. It is and will be a priority of the EU as stressed on the highest levels and as mentioned before. And lastly, EU Cybernet will be at your disposal to discuss the potential for cooperation in the coming years. In closing, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, I will be happy to take any questions later on. Uh, but meanwhile, here are our contacts and do not hesitate to use them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sim. And um, uh, as we will have a small panel later on now, I am glad to invite you, invite here Tunu, uh, Mr. Tunu Tammer. Mr. Tunu Tammer is the executive director of uh, CERT Estonia for two years now. He has taken a very strong stand in cutting the threat landscape and making Estonian cyberspace more resilient to cyber attacks. He has worked in the field of IT and internal security for over 10 years in total, mostly under the Ministry of Home Affairs. 
He has also held a diplomatic position as a consular for the EU Justice and Home Affairs based in Brussels and has worked uh, for the EU IT agency EU LISA. He has advised the European Commission on several information system programs and uh, is uh, also uh, uh, as a member of the Global Program Management Board um, appointed by the Council of the European Union. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you, Heli. Um, dear guests, dear viewers, dear friends, it's safe to say that if you are looking this online, you are seeing this almost as fast as people here in this room. Information travels at the speed of light, which means that no matter where you are in the globe, you will see that in less than one second. So this is something we need to understand when we talk about cyber. And when we talk about threats, how to prevent, how to manage and recover. When I was asked to make this presentation, I was given a very clear task to speak in a very non-technical terms. So I will try to, um, I will try to help you understand some of the risks and threats how I see in simple way. So how does a virus get in a computer? Well, it might come as a surprise, but 94% of the time it comes to you via email. This is highlighted by one of the recent studies looking at 2019. Every day we insert Estonia, analyze more than 5,000 new or mutated uh, malwares. And when I talk about mutated, this is not something like an ordinary virus that mutates organically. In cyberspace, computer viruses are mutated by people, by people who write malware. What we do in order to make life a little bit more safe with regards to people in Estonia, but also wider, we share quite a few of those uh, samples that we collect with key antivirus manufacturers with the goal of making the protection available to a number of different users worldwide a little bit faster. And this is how what we contribute a little bit every day towards safer and more secure cyberspace. It might come a little bit surprising on why cyber is often used as the means for weapon. If we look at the cost factor of a cyber attack vis-a-vis -vis a kinetic attack, we see that cyber is times and times cheaper. The cost of a server to launch an attack costs as little as 10 euros. A piece of malware nowadays purchased simply as a service costs something around 100 euros. So if you look why we are able to see so many different viruses flying around in our little corner of cyberspace is simply because the crime in cyberspace is so cheap. When internet was first brought into existence uh, decades ago as a means of communication, it was focusing on making this possible. Now we realize that we can't simply focus on connecting people, we have to find ways to make sure that this connection is safe, secure, from one end to another. In between 1945 to 1990, we had a period of Cold War. When one side had their own pieces of technology, they were defending this, and they were attacking the technology on the other side. Nowadays, we all have the same technology 
as a, as a smartphone in our pockets. We are using the same technology within our computers. There is no way we can build a technology that is secure for us and unsecure for our opponents. This does not work in technology. So, coming back to um, the issue of why cyber is used as an attack. I've already covered the fact that cyber is cheap, but it is also everywhere. It is commonplace these days. Um, when previous lecture uh, was talking about the number of people that use uh, internet-connected devices, um, I would like to focus on the fact that the number of devices nowadays is estimated to be around 25 billion, times more than there are people on Earth. This is expected to grow three times upwards of 75 billion, only within three years. Every device connected to an internet is an object to attack from the viewpoint of an attacker. And from the viewpoint of a user is something to be kept safe. Let's think about this for a moment. When we think that there are so many computers everywhere, controlling every aspect of the life. This is where we are today. But perhaps one of the most compelling reason why cyber is used as a means to attack is the simple truth that cyber is deniable. If a kinetic missile is launched, we can track where it came. If a cyber attack is launched, we can very rarely see immediately where it came. And when I started the presentation, I said that within one second, this video reaches across the globe. This is how fast the cyber attack can actually spread in the cyberspace. And we are not able to uh, immediately see how fast the malicious actor is doing what, and most importantly, from where. So what are the profiles of malicious actors? Who is behind? 75% of the cases, cyber attacks are motivated by the desire to earn money. So those people that are behind 75% of the time, they are nothing more than petty criminals. Sorry to say this, but this is the truth. Um, the rest, one quarter, uh, makes up uh, adversaries who have ideological or political reasons. Or simply sometimes the reason is as benign as I can. I just want to test if I can. It doesn't take a lot of reasons to launch an attack. A little bit uh, also about how an attack is carried out. There are a number of techniques and tools used by various attack uh, attackers. Scanning, phishing credentials, spreading malware, exploiting known bugs, or even discovering bugs that no one yet knows. Professional criminals use a combination of different tools for the ultimate purpose of 75% of the time to simply make money. We see so many scans happening every day. Within one second, I can easily say that uh, we see more than 100 scans at any given time of the day. Just looking at few devices here in Estonia. Phishing credentials is one of the most common these days because it gives an access. It gives an access to different accounts where attackers can launch further and further attacks. We are all human in the end. There are a number of different passwords we can remember. So we tend to reuse those passwords. 
once compromised, a malicious actor can do a lot of damage. Malware, I've already spoken on that. There are far too many number of, uh, of malware. If you think 5,000 minimum a day, it takes a lot of energy from a lot of different people, sometimes very, very skilled people, to craft those. People that write malware do not do it simply because they have nothing else to do. Someone pays for them. It might be criminal actors, it might be states. Looking for bugs, there are legitimate ways of using your technical skills to help make life safer. Ethical hacking is nothing to be shunned of. It is something that a lot of skilled people are making quite a decent money. And they are using their skills for good. But at the same time, there are people who are looking for vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities that no one knows yet, that can be exploited, and that can be sold. I borrowed a picture from our annual magazine of review uh, of, of the cyberspace to illustrate how an attack is carried out. If you remember, I said that the primary reason cyber is used to attack is because it is deniable. Well, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the image, you see that uh, a country A, a malicious actor, attacking country X, never ever does it directly. They always use numerous proxies, and when I mentioned that the attacks move at the speed of light, Determining who is behind is not so easy. It takes a lot of effort to try and put the puzzle together, put the pieces together, and to see who is behind an attack. If you look at the picture, you will see that um, sometimes it might be four, five, even ten different countries used as a proxy to take one step further, to take one step further, to simply hide who is behind an attack. And at each stage, you might use some of the tactics uh, and tools which I highlighted in the previous slide. You might use phishing in one case, you might use malware in another. But bottom line is, if you want to do harm, there are multiple ways you can do. This has been shown almost every day. One thing that still comes to me as a surprise when a lot of the speakers were saying, especially in the context of uh, international law, in, in terms of you know, when, when cyber attack leaves the cyber domain. Well, sorry to say, but I think this happens almost every other time. Imagine a credit card theft. Does it impact you in physical world? Yes, it does. If you are at the hotel, you can't pay. It does impact you in a physical world. So every other attack almost touches space outside cyberspace. So this is something that we need to be, uh, we need to be aware of. So what can we do when these are the odds? These are the odds against us, or for us. How do we better resist? We can definitely work with our international partners. But human-to-human -human communication is a little bit slower than machine-to-machine -machine communication. It takes time, especially if you want to build trust and you want to communicate. Machines do things a little bit faster, both in terms of attacking and in terms of de uh, defending. When it comes to the technical side of the life, we need to think how to best thwart the enemy. One 
term that is used often is deterrence. It's convincing an adversary that the cost of an attack outweighs the benefits. So how do we achieve this simple aspect in cyberspace? One way is, of course, to hold the adversary responsible. And Estonia and uh, a lot of countries have done so independently and in combination. But if we look at the way cyberspace is built, how different internet connected devices speak with one another, how different networks speak with one another, how internet in principle works, we see that very often an incident starts simply because a technical standard was never implemented. A standard exists, but was never implemented. Therefore, if I want you to take something back with you, something that could really make a significant difference, is the fact that systematical implementation of technical standards and best practices is the key in building a more cyber resilient ecosystem, not only for our constituents, but people around the world. The more safe we design our networks to be, the less not only can opponents attack us, but our devices can be used to attack someone else. So it's, it's key that we focus on those technical standards. Bear in mind that, as I said, when, when uh, the roots of internet began, no one thought about security. It was all for enabling communication, to allow different systems, to allow different people to communicate. Nowadays, when everything is connected, we need to start thinking about keeping things safe and to make sure that no one can tamper with the communication. <clears throat> Imagine a self-driving car with, um, which communicates with its brakes. If the brakes get the signal, or they don't get the signal, uh, that has the right signature, what could be the damage? The damage, at the best, is the car stops or it doesn't stop when it is supposed to stop. So, how do we make sure that we are in control of technology and not the, the other way around? Um, I wanted to uh, also highlight the fact that uh, most people never ever get a lesson on how to use electricity safely. Well, we should try the cyber. Every internet connected device is to be as easily used as electrical devices. Just plug in and you know it's safe by design and by standard. Therefore, I would like to really, uh, really promote efforts in making internet connected devices safe. One way, for example, is an easy update. If there is an issue, users simply press the button update and you have the issue fixed. Most systems, or quite a few systems today, updating the system can never take place or is simply too difficult for an everyday user. And why? Because there are no incentives or strong motivations for companies to develop those functionalities into a product. But this is something we need to drive towards in order to have a better outcome. So when I talk about deterrence by, uh, by denial, a, a simple question might rise. So how well do we perform? Well, I have... Uh, looked at one tool that is able to run the same test using the same criterion. We have looked at top 500 sites globally and top 750, a little bit more, sites in Estonia. As you can see, 
we are doing a little bit better than top 500 sites globally. To make this graph 100% green, almost no time it takes an investment of a thousand euros or more. Most of the stuff you can even do for free if you know what the standards are, what the best practices are, and simply do it. That's the key message here to, uh, to take away. And of course the message that an attacker is less likely to succeed in attacking Estonian part of the cyberspace. A little bit uh, on CERT teams also, or uh, cyber firefighting units. Um, CERT actually means um, Computer Emergency Response Team. It's a term for a, a team of experts who often respond to incidents that affect internet connected devices. It's our duty to manage uh, incidents uh, that occur in Estonian cyberspace or uh, other teams in other countries to manage the incidents that happen within their constituency and to assist end users or their constituents on how to mitigate attacks or to make the attacks less likely to succeed. Most CERT teams operate 24-7 because the internet works 24-7 and what is key is we share the information on weaknesses on what is happening in different parts of the cyberspace and we also share experience. Working with one another is absolutely vital if we want to make the common cyberspace as secure as possible. There are a few international forums that CERT teams participate. First is perhaps the most uh, wide uh, and international. It covers a number of different countries worldwide, a number of different uh, teams. TFC CERT, or the Trusted Introducer Service, is another expanding uh, fora for sharing the knowledge, building the, basically a contact book on who to call when something happens. It's important that your teams are listed in the phone book because if we detect an incident that affects your country, that affects your company, we need to be able to notify you. Not two weeks after, but immediately as we detect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tenu. And I think that your slide with those five countries where the attacks are originating uh, justifies the existence of us cyber diplomats. So uh, it, it has a technical um, origin that uh, cyberspace is a global phenomenon and, and we have to be um, all, all very strong there because as uh, you very well illustrated, the weakest link might be the issue. Um, and uh, I'm very glad that we have a small Estonian panel here during uh, our uh, very difficult times where panels have been banned. And, and we can um, uh, discuss the last uh, more maybe technical uh, issues um, in the end of this long masterclass. I, I have a question, Tonu, for you. Um, Estonia was largely un un unaffected by the um, recent global uh, malware campaigns. Uh, such as uh, WannaCry. So, uh, can you maybe um, explain how you are doing incident response and how you are doing this preventive work so that uh, Estonian cyberspace stays strong and resilient? That's a very good question, Heli. First of all, um, if uh, by showing the five different countries, uh, it's absolutely important that countries have cyber diplomats because each country needs to contribute. And we need to make sure each country understands and each country needs to have the right tools in their toolbox in order to manage their portion of cyberspace. Ultimately, it all comes down to the global cyberspace. So if we all work our part, we can manage the risk as a whole. Now, coming to your question, uh, how, did we, how did we manage to escape with very little losses? It all comes down to a simple thing. We need 
on top of talking about cybersecurity, we also need to do cybersecurity. As I mentioned, standards are good, but also best practice. We need to keep systems updated. WannaCry was able to deploy because systems were not patched. If you do your stuff the way best practices foresee, issues like WannaCry are like rain and you under the umbrella. It doesn't touch you. And how, how do you do incident response and the public-private um, partnership? How this works here? This is, uh, I think, uh, another area where Estonia is particularly um, good at. We share a lot of cases openly and transparently, not only within uh, our constituents here in Estonia, but worldwide. And it's important for others to learn from the mistakes that we make. Far worse is when they learn from their own mistakes. So that's, that's I think, that, that is uh, quite unique for Estonians, that, that we are so willingly and transparently sharing what happened, but also why it happened. <laughs> and on some of the times, also who was behind it. Thank you. It's a good explanation. And let, let me uh, turn now to um, uh, Seem. Uh, you explained us the, um, uh, Cybernet and, and how this network will be built, but what kind of organizations and uh, institutions you would like to join this network? Well, I, I gave two uh, numeric uh, objectives that we have, at least 150 institutions into the stakeholder community. And if you ask which kind of, in, of institutions, well, uh, we're looking for experts, and experts come with competence. And if I borrow from EU language, the competence centers, for instance, uh, in the EU could be uh, a perfect match for the stakeholder community. Essentially, the different uh, government institutions that uh, serve as the cyber defenders of the EU nations. But also, uh, I mean, it's obvious that a big chunk of the innovation, the innovative responses to cyber threats, they come from the private sector as well as academia. So, um, uh, universities, think tanks, institutions like that, they, they, they are also on our radar uh, to, to reach out as, as members of the stakeholder community. And as we speak now during those extraordinary times, and, and we are um, um, all meeting virtually now for, for many months, what do you think uh, now happens from now on? Do we continue doing everything virtually because it's sometimes also easier to uh, log in and not to take a very long flight? Or, or will the normal life resume at some point? Uh, what do you think is the effect of this uh, sudden virtual lifestyle for, for our future? Uh, maybe Tuno, you will ask. Um, the way I see, um, there are two parts of uh, building cyber capacity. There is the technical side, and then there is the human side. Um, the technical side, you can even build from home under the blanket. Just have the, the computer turned on and connected to the internet. What we can't do from home, and what we can't do virtually, is meeting people, building the relationships, sharing information, not virtually, but sharing it physically sharing the emotion, how I felt, how I dealt. You can do it to a degree from online, but physical interaction for humans is absolutely necessary. That's a very encouraging message for, for the technical person. So mm. <laughs> thank you, let's see. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to echo Tuno on that one. I mean, uh, the technology and, and, the, and the humans, they are both, they have their role to play in this, in this equation. Uh, as I mentioned, the EU is, is conducting a number of projects which deal with cyber capacity building. Uh, and on one hand, uh, we just recently reached out to the fellow project managers. And on one hand, uh, EU and its projects never stopped uh, its activities, I mean, running courses, educating people. But at the same time, doing that online uh, does have its limitations. The human factor, speaking to people, directly exchanging uh, ideas, uh, experience, that's, that's really not always the same done, done online. 
And as you have seen, the cyber security issue more from the um, national cyber uh, side and the defense side. What would be your advice for cyber diplomats community? Um, how can, uh, can we actually go and, and reach out to all these uh, different countries in the world and um, explain sometimes why uh, cyber awareness is important, why capacity building is important, why international law should be followed, why the technical standards should be followed? So, um, what could be the, your final word for the community of cyber diplomats? Can we ask? Um, that's, I think so, diplomats in this context are also important. As I mentioned, we have a collective responsibility for the internet. Each country looking at their side, combining it together as, 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 as a global internet. What is important uh, is that we share the experience that we have in each country. This is where diplomats often do, and how do I say, unappreciated work, or, or people don't understand what is, what is the benefit. But the other key thing is that we need to educate those people that make decisions on political level and to make them understand how technology works. As I was, uh, as I was explaining before, we cannot have secure communication and communication with security but with backdoors at the same time. You, you either have it secure or you don't. We need to educate political masters so that they can make better decisions so that we can implement those standards. Yeah, yeah again I can echo Tuno on that. I mean we've had uh, tremendous speakers today highlighting how actually the two worlds, the diplomacy and the technology, they are related. I mean today uh, if I can borrow from one of your slides, if certain people are the first responders in a way, so are diplomats uh, often in, in, uh, in your work. And I mean, learning from each other, that's I, I think essential for both sides on this one. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for all the viewers uh, who are still there after this long five hours. And uh, I think the work goes on and, um, and the community of cyber diplomats is growing and, and, and we hope to follow up this virtual cyber masterclass. Thank you.